Ahem. It's fake Andy Warhol's 15 minutes in theory. Episode 13, Whatever Happened to the Western Literary Canon Part 2, Anne Rand vs. Thomas Pynchon, etc. This guy, Reef, he talks about death works. And it's very interesting. He talks about a death work is a work which basically attacks the culture. And he said, this is a new thing since the 60s. And we kind of think, OK, pop music, blah, blah, all that. You know, that no, I'm not slagging hot pop music. Far from it. Because one of the things I've realized is that even though I've become more and more aware of, to a certain extent, the damage done by pop culture, I also love it. So that's what you call neurosis. <laughs> I'm a neurotic, culture neurotic. I think we all are. But I was reading something about it in the last few days, and, and uh, Reeve talks about Finnegan's Wake as being almost the, the perfect death work. It teaches, he says, in reading you learn how to destroy a culture by, by, by parodying and attacking the culture, by ridiculing the culture in words. This is the start of podcast two of two regarding Harold Bloom, the Western canon, etc. This podcast will focus on what I wanted to talk about in the first place before what became the prefatory material that took up the entire previous podcast. And that's a comparison between Ayn Rand and Thomas Pynchon. Again, this audio, most of it was recorded in February of this year, 2023, and I've only had time to organize it and edit it recently now in August and September. I want to thank listeners for tuning in, and I should warn you that, again, of course, there will be numerous audible footnotes that I've had to add to uh, Frankenstein this audio together because it was um, recorded all over the place. The files were scattered to the winds, and I've done my best to recreate and forge a somewhat cohesive audio experience. But I want to start, I wanted to start this episode just briefly by talking about another book that affected me, kind of like how Harold Bloom's Western canon book did, it's called The Literary 100, a ranking of the most influential novelists, playwrights, and poets of all time by Daniel Burt. This book is not as weighty as Harold Bloom's Western canon, but as I've talked about before, I love top 100 lists, and this is another one of them in book form that I encountered circa 2000. This book actually came out in 2001. And I mean, this was a good overview. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, this was a good overview for me to encounter. And I just want to go over what they say the top 10 is. I'm going to say a little bit about each of them, just because um, it's good to get these names out there, especially on a podcast or two in which I'm talking about literature. So number one, no surprise, William Shakespeare. I can't argue with that, but Shakespeare is an example of how I can understand why something is regarded so highly, and yet it's not really a personal favorite of mine. I don't like Shakespeare enough to make him my personal number one, but I can certainly see why he would be the most influential. I just never really got into the whole thing of getting lost in Shakespeare's work. 
people make an entire academic career out of Shakespeare, and that's as it should be. But aside from a handful of plays of his that I really, really like, Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and the Henry the Fourth plays, uh, because of the character of Falstaff. Aside from a handful of plays, I don't really like Shakespeare that much. I don't dislike Shakespeare. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, yeah, I like Romeo and Juliet. I like uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, okay. There's passages from The Tempest that I like. I think one aspect of Shakespeare's work that's not acknowledged as much as it should be is that so much of it is unoriginal. He took pre-existing stories and histories and redid them as plays aside from Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest. And that's something to consider when people talk about how unoriginal um, culture is now, that everything is a remake or it's uh, just a, a slight twist of something that we've seen many times over. Uh, Shakespeare was unoriginal. Uh, Shakespeare was very unoriginal in his themes and his stories, really. Footnote. And that's a good thing. I mean that as a compliment that he's unoriginal because actual cultural heritage, actual folklore is the same stories that are told repeatedly that hold a culture together. And Shakespeare did that. Shakespeare refined and perfected the stories of the culture, the histories and the fictional stories anything from Hamlet to the histories of various kings and Julius Caesar, etc. Shakespeare used stories that were already known, and he made the best version of them. In no small respect, the modern drive for originality is based on copyright laws, where you have to come up with something that's original in order to profit from it. But there's something to be said for refining the cultural material that's already there and using it to bind the people together and elevate the heritage and the sense of belonging, the common touchstones that form a civilization and are worth using and reusing. End of footnote. But overall... um. You can't argue with Shakespeare as, as number one, and he deserves that place, definitely. The next two entries we're going to have to handle together, and I'll explain why. Number two is Dante Alighieri, and number three is Homer. And yet, throughout the text of the book... Whenever other entries cite authors that are not the main entry, they will put in parentheses the placement. So in the text of any of the other entries that happen to mention Shakespeare in passing, they will put William Shakespeare, you know, parentheses, number one, close parenthesis. But throughout the, throughout the text, they will have Homer, parentheses, number two. Or when other entries mention Dante, they will put three after that. So it's kind of a clue that while the book was being composed, they had Homer as, as number two for a time, and they forgot to really proofread at the end. Do I think Dante outranks Homer? Yes, I think Dante's language, I think Dante's accomplishment is more impressive than the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad and the Odyssey are extremely important too, but... As a singular creation, the Divine Comedy is almost impossible to beat. Just as a James Joyce scholar, I would say Finnegan's Wake beats the Divine Comedy. But that's me. I like Dante. I like the Divine Comedy. Of course, I read it in translations. This is kind of another case of, well, I understand why he's ranked so high, but it's not really quite my thing. There's many aspects of the Divine Comedy that I like, many passages, but overall it's not really my thing. I kind of like the Vita Nuova, which is an earlier work of Dante's, where he talks about the figure of Beatrice. 
first. I, I like a lot of that, too, even though I know that the Divine Comedy is a far superior work. Even, you know, individual chapters or chunks of the Divine Comedy are superior to the Vita Nuova. And yet, I maybe it just maybe I'm a simple man, but I like the prose of the Vita Nuova. I also like uh, some of Dante's essays. The essay that Dante wrote on the vulgar tongue, I think it's called De Vulgari Eloquentis. <laughs> I'm probably butchering it. It's been so long since I've seen it written out. De Vulgari Eloquentis, I think it's called. I'll put a footnote if it's wrong. Footnote. It's De Vulgari Eloquentia on the elegance of the vernacular or of the vernacular. The common speech made elegant is the idea. End of footnote. The common people spoke Italian, but a lot of people wrote in Latin. And the essay is about whether great works are possible in the vulgar tongue. And I, I always like that essay. I think there's a lot in that essay. Three, Homer. Yeah, I mean, how can you argue with it? But uh, again, it's kind of the same thing where I don't have a personal connection to Homer that much. I don't really... I mean, he's a conglomerate personality anyway. He's kind of a, a group name for a mass authorship or a group authorship that forged the Iliad and the Odyssey over multiple generations. And yeah, I mean, there's a, I, I read them in the original Greek when I learned Greek from Samuel Siegel at Sarah Lawrence College. And yeah, I loved that. Um, obviously, the Iliad and the Odyssey are incredibly influential, very interesting, good works with a lot in them. I don't have a lot of personal affection for the works themselves, though. Footnote. Though I wasn't a huge fan of Homer's words, translated or untranslated, they never really struck that much of a chord with me. Nonetheless, I really like the idea of Homer and studying oral tradition, mostly amongst the ancient Greeks, really did make a huge impression on me. And I think studying how group authorship develops into national epics is essential for understanding culture. I think it's part of why rap music has been so successful and feels so comparatively genuine within the context of the modern world, because there's something about rap music that's a lot like the rhapsodes of ancient times, the oral tradition, the oral literature, where there are shared themes and even runs of words that are reused and s slowly accumulate into longer and longer songs. And Homer is the emblematic representative of an author that derives from oral tradition. So I definitely recommend studying Homer and what the Homeric songs were. And the authors you would want to look into would be Adam Perry and Milman Perry. End of footnote. So, do I understand why Homer is in the top three? Absolutely. Would he be in my personal top three? No. But if I was going to try to create a objective list, yeah, Homer would have to be in the top three. For Leo Tolstoy. Now, here is something kind of interesting, I think, because here is an example of someone who lived into the 20th century who has centuries less influence possible compared to most of the other names on this list, and yet he rates so highly. And it's because he's the greatest novelist ever, Leo Tolstoy. Fyodor Dostoevsky is rated at number 15, so Dostoevsky is pretty high up. William Faulkner is number 14. I'd put Dostoevsky above Faulkner. T.S. Eliot is 16. I think T.S. Eliot should be above Faulkner, too. Anyway, Leo Tolstoy, the greatest novelist ever because of War and Peace and Anna Karenina. Dostoevsky may have the greatest novel of all time in The Brothers Karamazov, but if we accept that, then we still have to say that 
Leo Tolstoy has number two and number three with War and Peace and Anna Karenina, and they neither one of them are far behind Brothers Karamazov. And what is Dostoevsky's second greatest novel? Crime and Punishment? Maybe. Maybe Demons, but probably Crime and Punishment is his number two. And that is far less than War and Peace or Anna Karenina. I like Crime and Punishment a lot. I like Dostoevsky on a personal level more than I like Leo Tolstoy. And yet it is obvious that Leo Tolstoy is the greatest novelist of, of all time, and it's not even close. I mean, number two, I would say number two would be Dostoevsky. Other people would say probably Charles Dickens, but I would say Dostoevsky. But Leo Tolstoy, what I really like about Leo Tolstoy, what I want to put out there is Leo Tolstoy, toward the end of his life, wrote a book, a nonfiction book called What is Art? And that book is amazing, even if you disagree with it, because this is towards the end of Leo Tolstoy's life, he renounced a lot of his prior work and he became more and more Christian, and he basically excoriated a lot of recent art for leading, um, leading the world into decline. Sound familiar? But he was saying this, uh, you know, 130 years ago or whatever it was, and it's just a very interesting book, even if you disagree with it. He talks about um, folk art versus art that's funded by and for the elites and that ends up corrupting the society. He really champions folk art and art that speaks toward a Christian good, as he would say. And even if you disagree with a lot of it, or even if you're not sure of a lot of it, which I'm, I'm not, it's still a very good book. And it is, I would say, it is on target often. So what is art by Leo Tolstoy? Number five, Geoffrey Chaucer. So it's kind of like an upset, in a way, historically speaking, for Leo Tolstoy to outrank Geoffrey Chaucer. But I think it's right because Geoffrey Chaucer in quotes, just, just has that one work that's so great. I know Chaucer wrote some other minor things, but it's mostly the Canterbury Tales. I can understand why the Canterbury Tales is liked so much, but again, as with many of the ones I've listed here, I'm not a big Chaucer fan. I'm not a big Shakespeare fan. It's easy to see how Shakespeare surpassed his predecessor, creatively and chronologically, Geoffrey Chaucer. It's, it's easy to see that. Chaucer is still very important, and the Canterbury Tales are good and fun, just not really my thing. Number six, Charles Dickens. So they're saying Charles Dickens is the second greatest novelist of all time, and that's hard to argue with. I personally like Dostoevsky more. I think Dostoevsky has more four-star works and above, but Charles Dickens wrote a lot, and there's a lot of it that's good. Great Expectations is great. Bleak House is great. A Tale of Two Cities is very good. I mean, Charles Dickens just has very good work after very good work. He has so many of them, so many. And it's hard to argue. I, I do like Charles Dickens. Really, when you think about the stories that have entered the popular consciousness and have maintained popularity through the 20th century and into the 21st. I mean, at least until recently, maybe we still have it, but the, a, a Christmas Carol did survive for a very long time in the popular consciousness as one of the books that, or one of the stories that really tied the culture together. Number seven, James Joyce. So Charles Dickens, who is not really formally innovative much at all, outranks James Joyce on this list. I can see why, but personally, in my opinion, James Joyce is, from my perspective, the greatest word chooser of all time, the greatest linguist of all time, the most formidable man in the arena, James Joyce. That's why I chose him. That's why I chose him for my PhD, because I wanted to grapple with the greatest wrestler of all time, James Joyce, the guy who could take on William Shakespeare. And footnote. 
You know, the famous desert island question, uh, someone once asked James Joyce if on a desert island and you could have only the one book, uh, what would it be? And he replied uh, famously, uh, and I think this is verbatim, I should like to answer Dante, but I would have to take the Englishman because he is richer. Wonderful word to use there, and of course he means Shakespeare rather ruefully, and of course from an Irish point of view he is being charmingly uh, and wittily resentful of Shakespeare's uh, priority, though certainly in Finnegan's Wake uh, he does, I think, as much with countering the influence of Shakespeare as any writer in the language has been able uh, to do. End of footnote. I don't know. I mean, in some ways, in some skewed modernist avant-garde ways, you can look through the prism of reality and say that James Joyce surpassed William Shakespeare. You can say that. Not that controversial of a thing to say. Overall, no, of course not. But I like James Joyce. Do I? I mean, I'm, I'm not upset at his ranking, number seven. I'm not upset about that. Marcel Proust was number 17. And it's like, fuck off. Proust needs to be way higher. But James Joyce, number seven, he's got Ulysses. Almost everybody can see the greatness of Ulysses. I like Finnegan's Wake more. I think Finnegan's Wake is the most impressive, most impressive work ever created, Finnegan's Wake, by a single author, at least, by a single craftsman. And I know that Joyce would say that all of reality co-authored Finnegan's Wake or whatever, but... Yeah, Joyce number seven, not a lot to say. I like James Joyce. He was an asshole. He was a screaming egomaniac. He was a malignant influence on many people, including his children. But great writer, great writer, James Joyce number seven. Number eight on this list of the literary 100, John Milton. I can see why. I mean, it, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't shock me to see John Milton ranked so high. Of course, he's famous for Paradise Lost. Of course, Paradise Lost is gr one of the greatest, if not the greatest, English language long-form poem. He's paired in my mind and probably in a lot of other people's minds with Dante. And the Divine Comedy is paired with Paradise Lost. Similarly, and yet Milton ranks six places below Dante, and I can see why. As great as Paradise Lost is, and as great as Satan is as Milton's protagonist, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained is no match for the Divine Comedy. I like Milton, I like Paradise Lost, but I'm kind of happy to see that they thought Charles Dickens surpassed John Milton. I mean, John Milton's probably... Uh, the immediate precursor of great British writers before Charles Dickens. And Charles Dickens writing in the the lower form of prose. Charles Dickens with his you know, little prose stories does surpass John Milton. I would say so, yeah. I would say he surpasses Milton by more than two places too, but there you go. Number nine, Virgil, the Latin poet Virgil, who uh, showed up as a character in the Divine Comedy. He was Dante's guide to the afterworld. And I read a lot of Virgil in the original Latin when I studied Latin again with Samuel Siegel of Sarah Lawrence College. We read Virgil. We read entire books of Virgil's Aeneid and it's good. It's it's very good. It's very elegant, very well structured. I like Virgil. I like Virgil's prose more than I like Homer's similar prose. Uh, I call it prose because <laughs> it's not my language. It's always I'm always translating it. You know, I mean, they, they always call it song. You know, Homer sings. Homer sings in uh, dactylic hexameter. Virgil was a real singular person, whereas Homer. We're not even entirely certain if Homer was real. We think there might have been a Homer, but a hell of a lot of different people had their 
hands, figuratively speaking, in the Iliad and the Odyssey before they became written down in the form that we have them now. So here again, you know, I, I recognize Virgil's place. It's very hard to compare. For me personally, of course, T.S. Eliot is above Virgil. And yet if you showed, if you showed T.S. Eliot's work to someone, even in the 1800s, they would, they would think it was the writings of a madman. As staid and conservative as T.S. Eliot is, he would appear to be a madman in the 1800s. And Virgil was read for centuries as one of the, if not the greatest poets. And number 10, the last one that I'm going to go into in any detail, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Yes, I like Goethe. I like Goethe on a personal level more than anyone else in this top 10, except for James Joyce. I like Goethe because I think Faust is just incredible. I think Faust is incredible, and I think the other novels, Wilhelm Meister that I've read, and the essays I've read, The Sorrows of Young Werther even, they're good, I like them, and then there's Faust. There's these pretty good works, and then there's Faust, which is a national epic, if not the epic of the European continent, really. And again, it's a remake. The Faust story was told many times over, and when it finally got to Goethe, it was given the best treatment ever. So can you imagine if when Goethe was about to write Faust, someone said, oh, we've, we've had it with these unoriginal remakes. We want something new. No, fuck that. He was perfecting it. And do I like Faust more than I like the Divine Comedy? Yes. Do I understand why, in the interest of being objective, the Divine Comedy is rated above it and Dante is rated above Goethe? Yes, I understand that too. So... That's the top 10 of the Literary 100 by Daniel S. Burt. Just a few more brief placements. Cervantes was number 11, so Don Quixote, arguably the greatest novel, although it's two parts, but arguably the greatest novel of all time, only enough to warrant number 11. I like Cervantes. I like Don Quixote. Yeah, T.S. Eliot, 16, Proust, 17. Now, where did Kafka rate? If I recall, it was, yeah, Kafka rated as number 31, one place behind Flaubert and two places behind Aeschylus. I mean, I can understand that. I can understand why he's, you know, only, only the 31st greatest author of all time. I can understand that, sure, whatever. Uh, What else? Do I want to mention Oscar Wilde, number 100, Richard Wright, number 97. F. Scott Fitzgerald was what, number like 90 or something? F. Scott Fitzgerald, number 88. Victor Hugo, number 89. Now, Victor Hugo, I don't even like Victor Hugo that much. Victor Hugo is way better than F. Scott Fitzgerald. Anyway, and I say that as someone who likes The Great Gatsby. Anyway, that is a, just a brief appetizer to get us into this episode. I'm sure it didn't take too long, right? The Literary 100 by Daniel Burt. So talking about the canon, just a little something to supplement our discussion about the canon and uh, Harold Bloom, etc. So again, thanks for your patience, as always, and try to enjoy the rest of the episode. It's a few days later, and I'm attempting to record the segments on Rand and Pinchon. But today, all of a sudden, I have a sore throat, so we're just going to have to fight through this. So, let's talk about Anne Rand first. Now, even though I've singled these two authors out because I think that they are, in some sense, the most important canonical or pseudo-canonical authors after World War II that came to prominence after World War II, I should say. A lot of my compliments on them would seem rather backhanded almost. 
I have criticisms of them, even though I think they're, in some sense, the greatest in their era. That said, as alluded to previously, authors that held over after World War II who began their careers and had big success and huge achievements prior to World War II would include people like Samuel Beckett, Jorge Luis Borges, and Samuel Beckett's Endgame, which is arguably his greatest work, that came out in 1957, the same year as Atlas Shrugged. So the eras overlap, these um, not completely arbitrary eras, even though Endgame came out well after the end of World War II, and even though Samuel Beckett lived till 1989, He's from the past era. He's from the pre-World War II era, whereas Rand, the, the flowering of her greatness happened after World War II. And even in saying that, I know that I'm, gonna, I'm going to put people off. Don't worry, there will be criticisms of Anne Rand also, just as there will be criticisms of Thomas Pynchon, even though, I mean, Gravity's Rainbow is a towering masterpiece of its era, of the post-World War II era. These are the best we've got, in my opinion. Anyway, in beginning to talk about Ayn Rand, I want to allude to a 1998 list that the Modern Library put out. The Modern Library is a, or was a, prestigious series of hardcover books. First they were hardcover, then they came out with Modern Library paperbacks, but particularly the ones that the Modern Library put out with the, with the silver covers, the silver dust jackets, circa 2000. I think those are beautiful. I love the paper. I love the font, the font size, the margins. And when I went about reading the Western canon, which for a few years in the early 2000s, I was reading about 400 pages every day. That's when and where I read all this stuff and I did the undertaking on my own. No thanks to, well, not much thanks to the educational institutes that I was enrolled in. But there is this 1998 top 100 list, the Modern Library's top 100 novels of the 20th century. They did a nonfiction list too. And even though the century wasn't quite over yet, I guess they felt that they could go ahead and do a top 100 because because the quality of writing had fallen off fallen off so much anyway by that point that they could be reasonably assured that in the last two or three years of the century uh, nothing remarkable at all would be written for fiction in the Western world. But anyway, so this is another list, and I saw this list hanging up in a laureate's bookshop. There used to be bookstores and different chains of bookstores everywhere. Every mall you went to, every town, pretty much they had some sort of chain and there was this, I think it was pronounced Laureate's Books in a mall in, uh, if you know the dead mall streams that I've done on Instagram, it was in that mall. There was this Laureate's Books. I think it became Walden Books after that and then it closed down just like a lot of other chains closed down and now there's only Barnes and Noble and nothing else really or hardly anything else. But I remember being in Laureate's books in that mall, in the, in the dead mall uh, before it was dead. And they had, I think they had lists that you, I think they had printouts of this that people could just take home or at the very least they had copies of this list prominently hanging up in the literature section and they had the Modern Library Top 100 Novels of the Century. And they had the editor's list and they had the reader's list. I guess they did a poll somewhere. The editor's list uh, had Ulysses as number one, The Great Gatsby as number two, and A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man at number three. I should say that Joyce's actual greatest book, Finnegan's Wake was like number 38 or something, which if you think about those rankings on their own, it's just laughable that um, a portrait of the artist would be so close to Ulysses when Ulysses is 10 times the novel that a portrait of the artist is and that The Great Gatsby would be number two. I mean, I like The Great Gatsby. I wrote a play 
version of The Great Gatsby when I was in high school that was our senior play. Uh, and yet, The Great Gatsby is a safe, cookie cutter novel in a sense it's one of those that fits into that category neatly it's easily readable in high school and yet it's only one place behind ulysses footnote i should point out that these lists were for english language first books uh, otherwise you would have a lot of novels like uh, the magic mountain or the trial or Proust's work uh, handily beating The Great Gatsby, The Tin Drum, or the novels of Milan Kundera, who I've mispronounced as Milan Kundra elsewhere. Uh, those European works, they are obviously in the top 100 novels of the 20th century, but the Modern Libraries list was for English language first books. End of footnote. So there are all these oddities, and I could do a whole list on uh, the Modern Library's list. Those making the fake Andy Warhol wiki uh, can place this list alongside the NME Top 100 Albums list from 1994 as one of these lists, pre-millennium lists that I read in the late 90s that informed my opinions on different art and... Also in there would be the AFI Top 100 Films list that Orson Welles topped. Uh, that's another list that I voraciously went through and used to choose what I wanted to consume. And I didn't just mold my opinions to whatever the list said. I uh, Footnote. For example, they had uh, The Education of Henry Adams by Henry Adams as number one on the nonfiction list. They did a nonfiction list also. And despite that being a number one on a critic's list, I didn't like the education of Henry Adams much at all. I don't think I even finished it. I couldn't get into it at all. End of footnote. I did tend to get a lot out of what these lists were recommending to me. I did try to read Ulysses in 98, 99, and I didn't get very far. I did read A Portrait of the Artist because I saw it on this list. And I really enjoyed Portrait of the Artist as a young man. But also, as I said, they had a reader's poll for the top 100 novels, and the reader's poll was topped by Atlas Shrugged. And number two was The Fountainhead, also by Ayn Rand. Uh, now, number three was L. Ron Hubbard's Battlefield Earth, and there were other L. Ron Hubbard books on prominent positions of the reader's list as well. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, Ayn Rand's books did not appear at all on the top 100 editors list. So what does this mean? Footnote. This reader's poll itself is like the here comes everyone idea. Uh, here comes everyone is a term and a conglomerate personage in Finnegan's Wake, but it represents uh, the age of the people, the turn of history where everybody gets their say. We, we go from the age of the gods to the age of heroes to the age of the people to the chaotic age or whatever you want to call it. There's different ways of describing the four ages. But the age of the people is here comes everyone. And, well, sometimes the elite seem to want here comes everyone. They want democracy. They think they can control democracy. They think they can use various techniques of mass psychology to control everything. If they unlock the masses and give the masses free reign then they have techniques to control them even better than they would if things weren't so open. There's a lot in that, but I don't want to go into it. I mean, read Bernays, read Le Bon, read Walter Lippmann. But sometimes, sometimes the people don't vote the way that they're supposed to. And sometimes here comes everyone results in someone like Ayn Rand being voted number one. You want the people to have their say? 
okay, the people have had their say, and they've elected Ayn Rand. And the majority of the elites, yes, Ayn Rand herself is elitist. And yes, various factions of the elite like Ayn Rand or have liked, but overall, the emerging ethos is not Randian. The emerging ethos is definitely not Randian. It's closer to Marxist. It's not Marxist either. It's closer to Marx than Rand. But the people like Ayn Rand. The people like Ayn Rand. End of footnote. Harold Bloom hates Ayn Rand. Harold Bloom says Ayn Rand couldn't write her way out of a wet paper bag. I think Ayn, I think Ayn Rand is discriminated against even though she has severe flaws. And as I'm going to argue, if it's not clear already, I think that the greatest novel of the post-World War II period is either Atlas Shrugged or Gravity's Rainbow. And that's kind of what this match is about. It really comes down to that. Now they've both written other works. Even their masterworks are flawed. But I, I do think that in the absence of an epic, it comes down to that. It comes down to these two authors and it comes down to each of their greatest books going head to head for the title. I like Hierarchy. I like Aegon. And I think that is the question worth asking. I think that is the question of our time for post-World War II literature. Maybe it says a lot about how far we've fallen. I think it does. But I think that is the question. And Harold Bloom, as I said, Harold Bloom hates Ayn Rand. I think Harold Bloom is typically prejudiced against Ayn Rand the same way a lot of people are just knee-jerk prejudiced against her. I don't agree with all of Nietzsche's philosophy. I don't agree with all of Dostoevsky's political ideas. I don't agree with Ibsen all the time. I think Ibsen can be shrill. Uh, I think Bertolt, Bertolt Breck can be obnoxious. And yet, those authors, people can find their way to like them, whereas Anne Rand touches too much of a nerve and they just dismiss her completely. Harold Bloom dismisses her completely. Harold Bloom also similarly dismisses Stephen King and J.K. Rowling. Harold Bloom had a lot of negative things to say about Harry Potter. Well, I, I partly out of my quite negative reaction to the uh, prevalence of the Harry Potter books, which, which seemed to me rubbish, uh, only good for the dustbin, where, where they will certainly wind up in a generation or so. Uh, I only attempted to read Harry Potter once. I didn't even read a full page. It's not for me. Everything I've heard about Harry Potter and the culture, I don't like what its influence seems to be. I don't seem to like uh, what it's done. But I can, I can at least hold out the idea that this resonated in the culture for a reason. It did teach a generation of people kind of to value reading. It did teach them something about storytelling. Maybe it taught them things that I would not really like, but I can at least hold out some shred of respect and potential goodness or whatever you want to call it in uh, Harry Potter. And even more so with Stephen King. Now, I think Stephen King is a piece of shit. I think that Stephen King was also a typical guilt-tripped white male liberal alcoholic with numerous prejudices that seem all the more obvious once uh, Stephen King himself went on Twitter and you could really see the mental illness there. And yet Stephen King wrote stories that resonated with the common people. I don't think the stories are completely worthless. I like some of them. Some of them are just neat and yet at the same time, even before Harry Potter, when Stephen King was this big name, Stephen King was the guy. And even though I liked horror, even though I liked some of the movies based on books that he wrote, it always seemed to me to be overdone. So I'm of mixed minds about someone like Stephen King. I mean, he, he does not even rise to the level of reading for high school English classes. I don't think his books are even that good, aside from maybe one or two. Not that I'm an expert, 
but there's only so much that I can read when an author does not really seem useful or profound. Instead, he seems very typical of his time, and yet because he's so typical of his time, that in some way helped him resonate with the readership, and the transference there between author and the readership does not seem completely negative to me. So I can hold out some hope for Stephen King. I can hold out some hope for even the influence of Harry Potter. Harold Bloom can't, and Harold Bloom would not extend any sort of olive branch or any sort of invitation towards the reading of Anne Rand. And I don't think that the prejudice against her is nearly as warranted as it is with Stephen King or J.K. Rowling because Anne Rand has a good, she's very original, no one else like her, of course, and yet she has literary style. She was informed by the great literature of the past. She speaks of Victor Hugo's influence on her, Dostoevsky. Now, other people say, as a philosopher, she's very, very shallow. She doesn't deserve recognition in the literary canon or the philosophical canon, just because uh, she doesn't she doesn't draw on the past. She's not, you know, she's her own she's her own school of thought in some ways. But how does she address the tradition as it is? Well, she she likes Aristotle. She doesn't really engage with past philosophy or build on it or criticize it that much other than, than fairly superficial things like A is A from Aristotle. She doesn't like Plato. She, of course, doesn't like Marx. But she's not very rigorous in her engagement with past philosophy. I don't necessarily see that as a fault. Um, again, just to make it clear, I'm not an objectivist. I'm not a Randian. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not really, no. And yet, I don't think Ayn Rand really needs these rigorous credentials to be allowed into some sort of club. I think that what Ayn Rand wrote and what she did and the effects she had kind of stand on their own. You don't need to wear your influences on your sleeve all the time. You don't need to constantly big up people from the past. I mean, the greatest rapper of all time, a lot of people say is Notorious B.I.G., and yet when asked who influenced him, B.I.G. said, no one really influenced me. So how did you first get started? Who influenced you? Ain't nobody really influenced me, you know what I'm saying? I just... And when you, when you listen to Notorious B.I.G., that kind of seems true. B.I.G. knew what the past canon of rap and hip-hop was, but B.I.G. is kind of his own thing. The style doesn't really come from anybody else. It's his own style. Same with Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is the notorious B.I.G. of the post-World War II literary canon. What did I read of Ayn Rand? Well, when I was in high school, I think probably shortly after I saw this list, I read The Fountainhead, and I liked The Fountainhead. That does not mean I agree with every idea in The Fountainhead or that I agree with anyone who would use The Fountainhead as a justification for some sort of political action. But yeah, I thought The Fountainhead was pretty good. I, I liked the idea of it, the heroic nature of the architect figure in it, the female character in it. And um, The Fountainhead does seem like a, like a small-scale trial run for Atlas Shrugged. I think the female character in The Fountainhead was named Dominique, whereas in Atlas Shrugged, it's Dagny Taggart. In The Fountainhead, the hero man, the Randian man, is Howard Rourke, isn't it? And in Atlas Shrugged, it's John Galt, who is just a larger version, in, in some sense, of Howard Rourke. Footnote. I should say something more about what the plot of Atlas Shrugged is. It's about various uh, industry leaders and people in positions of authority in the rail industry, the steel industry, shipping, engineering, and they're dealing with various problems with the government. And eventually there seems to emerge this conspiracy of important people who are disappearing. And it's led by this guy, John Galt, 
who wants uh, the brains of the world, as he calls it, to go on strike. So because they're sick of the government interfering with their ambition and with regulations curtailing their ability to develop creatively and freely and use their gifts to uh, contribute to a increasingly sophisticated society. They don't want to work for a society that doesn't appreciate them and that doesn't want them to use their talents to the height of their ability. So they either deliberately sabotage their industries or they go on strike and at one point, John Galt says something like this, always stuck with me, that they'll know that they've won when the lights in New York City go out. I thought that was kind of a poignant line. And it basically follows, the book basically follows the female protagonist through as she sleeps with various heads of industry. Uh, she's, she's a head of industry herself, I think. Um, she's the head of Taggart Rail Lines. I could be wrong, but I think she was like the, the head of one of the rail line companies. But she goes through and she becomes a part of this conspiracy, basically, of industrialists and smart, rich people who just say, look, I've had it with trying to provide for you ungrateful pieces of shit and for your obnoxious government that wants to hold me back. So that's the plot, and it plays out over, depending on the edition, 1,200 pages, roughly. End of footnote. And even if Rand never wrote Atlas Shrugged, she'd still have a pretty good reputation, uh, at least among her acolytes, and a somewhat good reputation uh, amongst other people with the Fountainhead. And actually, I think maybe if it wasn't for Atlas Shrugged, if she hadn't become so prominent, then maybe some of the critics who dismiss her completely, if she hadn't become such a big deal, maybe they would have been more inclined to give The Fountainhead a fair shake. I think The Fountainhead's pretty good. So I read The Fountainhead, and maybe 10 years later in the mid-2000s, I read Atlas Shrugged finally. I think of Atlas Shrugged the way that I think of Dave Sims' comic book series Cerebus, which is 300 issues long. So Dave Sims' masterwork is 300 issues long. It takes a little while to get going. When it hits its stride at about issue, I don't know, 30, it gets pretty good. It gets better and better and better and better. And then in the late 100s, I think roughly in the late 100s, um, Dave Sim was kind of overcome by paranoid schizophrenia. And roughly the last third, maybe only the last quarter, something like that, of the graphic novel series Cerebus is almost literally unreadable. The guy went nuts. People say that Dave Sim became a misogynist. People say that Dave Sim became a, a weirdly religious nut. The core thing that happened was that Dave Sim went crazy, went literally crazy in everything that is called his misogyny or is called his religious intolerance is a byproduct of uh, paranoid schizophrenia taking over his life. I think that he still put a lot of thought into his work, but the end of his masterwork is kind of overcome by his paranoid schizophrenia. He's not unlike uh, Glenn Keeley in some senses, and I only think of that because they're both Canadians. But the point I'm making is that despite the last quarter or the last third of the series being, um, I mean, I, I hesitate to even call it bad. It's literally unreadable. It's literally unreadable. Despite that, it's so good up to that point that I think that, I think that Cerebus is far and away the greatest Western American comic book series. It's not even close. And I would compare Atlas Shrugged to that, although I, I don't think Anne Rand went crazy per se, but when Atlas Shrugged really gets to the end, when she she's building towards something and her ideas, which are very compelling up to a point, when her protagonists start to get what they want and when she kind of goes on basically a tirade, I, I, would, I would call the last 200, 250 pages of Atlas Shrugged just an, an alienating 
tirade, even though I'm sure she wouldn't see it that way, um, it, it completely loses me. But up to that point, the first, what, whatever, 900 pages or 1,000 pages maybe, um, I find Atlas Shrugged very compelling. It's, it's a great argument for heroism. It, it really is in its own way. And it's, it's beautifully written. It's, it's wonderfully written. Very well composed and thrilling up to a point. So there you have it. That's what I think of Atlas Shrugged. Uh, the, up, up to a point, it's extremely engaging. And you don't really need to agree with every idea that she has to appreciate that. But beyond a, a certain point, it does lose me. I'm not sure exactly when that point is. There is a part in there where one character gives a speech. And the, the speech basically outlines... Rand's philosophy and the speech is extremely long and if I'm told that if this speech was actually read aloud then it would take eight hours to read this speech and it didn't it doesn't make any sense in the context of trying to understand the situation as a guy giving a speech it's supposed to be a fairly typical event and this man gives a speech that takes up so many pages of the novel that if it was said aloud, it would be like an entire work day of just one man speaking. I don't care. It's, it's so compelling. It doesn't matter that there isn't realism there. It, it doesn't matter. It's um, wonderfully composed, wonderfully organized, well thought through, on its own terms, very well thought through. I just think Atlas Shrugged was great up until, I don't know, roughly page 900 or, or something like that. And at which point it, it completely loses me. I'm so unengaged after that point that I can't even really um, fasten my mind on what exactly I don't like about it, other than to say, I don't like where she's going with this. Uh, you know, other than to say blanket terms that you've lost me. But that's what happened. And it, it goes on for a few hundred pages after that point. So that's where I dock it. Now, Anne Rand, to go back in time in my own personal biography, Anne Rand also put out this book. I think it was taken from a course that she taught called The Art of Fiction. And it's basically a How to Write Like Me book. I would compare it favorably to Stephen King's much celebrated book on writing. I think Anne Rand's The Art of Fiction is much better. I found um, Stephen King's on writing to be horrible. You know, do you, do you want, it's basically, do you want to be a hack? Whereas Anne Rand's book, and I read this before the year 2000. I read this when I was a teenager. There's a lot in the book that I don't agree with. There's a lot in the book that rubs me the wrong way. But the points Anne Rand raises are good, and I think people should be challenged on these points. Now, I really like James Joyce. I, I would have some misgivings about Joyce's work, too. I'm not a complete sycophant for James Joyce, uh, the way a lot of the people that I met in grad school seemed to be. But I like James Joyce. He's a hair's breadth away from being in my top rank of authors. I mean, I've said my, my favorite authors are Marcel Proust and Franz Kafka. And Joyce is right behind them, despite my misgivings about Joyce. Anne Rand doesn't like James Joyce. Anne Rand doesn't like obscurantist writing. Anne Rand doesn't like Franz Kafka either. She, in this book... The Art of Fiction, Rand makes negative comments about Kafka. Uh, he's too obtuse. He, he doesn't, his stories aren't clear. She makes similar comments about James Joyce also. There's one particularly fun uh, little quote here where Rand says Joyce was worse than G Gertrude Stein. She doesn't like this uh, highfalutin, obscurantist, modernist writing that is very difficult, that is very academic, that needs to be puzzled over. And in her book, she argues for writing that is more or less straightforward, clear. She wants to convey her ideas to the audience, and she says that if an author can't really say why he wrote something or what 
some sort of uh, supposed symbol in his book means, then that's a problem. That's a negative. Now, I myself personally, I always liked and I continue to like a lot of avant-garde stuff. I do like some obscurantist stuff, including T.S. Eliot, whose works are, whose greatest works are filled with allusions that aren't particularly clear. I like a lot of what David Lynch does, and of course I like Franz Kafka, and yet Rand's perspective really forces me to scrutinize uh, my taste. It really forces me to think about when artwork is deliberately unclear or when illusion, unthought through illusion can be a shield or a cover or a cope for just not thinking your ideas through enough. And I, I've criticized Bob Dylan in a, in a previous episode where he seems to have started the trend where pop songs don't really have to mean anything. They can just seem to mean something really profound. And, uh, you know, now we've got a whole industry that is based upon these songs whose meanings aren't clear. And the rejoinder, of course, well, not, is, of course, well, not everything has to be clear. But what if nothing's clear? Or what if almost nothing is clear and yet people take it for the most profound messages ever? Isn't there a mass problem with this? Well, yes, there could be. And that is what Ayn Rand calls into question. She also says somewhere in her book on writing that she can justify every word and every punctuation mark in the entire 650,000 word work of Atlas Shrugged. And I remember when I first read that, I thought that oh, this is just ridiculous. On the one hand, she can't do that. And on the other hand, no one should have to. We should just go with our feelings, follow our muse, put down whatever words seem right. And now when I look back on it, yeah, I think almost always an, an author should be able to justify what they put down. An, an author should be able to. Why would you write words that you don't really know what the fuck they mean or you don't really have some sort of idea of what their effect is? Whereas Rand just says, look, I can justify everything that I wrote. You should try to. People should try to. And if you're not, you better have a good reason. And if you're just putting down uh, the automatic text that your subconscious directs you to put down, you better have a good muse. You better have a good um, demon, diamond, daemon inside you. And uh, m most people do not. It's, you, so looking back on that um, instruction from Ayn Rand in this book, I remember when I was a teenager and when I was in my early 20s, I thought that sentence uh, of hers really stuck out. It, I thought it was ab absurd. You can't justify everything in, your, in a book that big. Well, an author really needs to write carefully and read carefully, and that's what she was uh, trying to push her readership towards uh, when she gave that recommendation. And as the years pass, I, I do think that a lot of what she had to say, especially in this um, book on the art of fiction, I think, I think it was worth reading. I think it was worth considering. Also in the book, she talks about popular fiction. And she's not averse to popular fiction. She liked uh, detective novels and she liked popular film. She wrote scripts for Hollywood early on or helped with the writing of scripts. So she's portrayed as this um, arrogant, elitist, very cold, and yet not only do her novels have a lot of passion and a lot of sex in them, but the fiction that she liked was not, um, she wasn't elitist in her tastes. She liked a good deal of popular fiction. And one thing that she said, uh, I can't find the actual passage right at the moment. I'm sure it's in The Art of Fiction book even though the index is um, of no help to me. Footnote. No, it's in her book, The Romantic Manifesto, which similarly lays out her aesthetic tastes. 
And by romantic, she means uh, not necessarily love, but the romantic era, uh, the aesthetics of roughly the first half of the 1800s, which goes along with her fondness for Victor Hugo and that style of presentation in the work of fiction. End of footnote. She makes a distinction between the James Bond novels and the James Bond films, and she says that the books fit into the romantic tradition, and she means romantic with a large R, with a capital R, whereas the films seem like crass parodies. And she's, she's talking about the old James Bond films at the time. Those are the ones out. Uh, she's talking about the Sean Connery films, and she finds them to be parodies. She thinks that they're non-serious, goofy bullshit, whereas the novels are uh, romantic in a respectable way. And I've always thought about that because people in more recent decades, they look on the older James Bond films as if they were the straightforward, respectable take. But the newer James Bond films or the newer films, the newer action films, they are the parodies. They are an insult to the integrity of the original James Bond But Anne Rand is saying that, no, from her perspective, even the original films were an insult to the novels. So it just shows you the drift that popular culture has been taking for many decades now. What seems to be a staid classic uh, with a lot of respectability now in its own time would have been or could have been a crass parody of the actual source material or of the precursors to it. So that shows you the drift of popular culture and how everything is continually being further and further cheapened. Um, Everything seems like a cheaper and cheaper copy, a more and more superficial, a fainter copy than uh, the previous iteration. In the end, I think one of the clearest examples of the ultimate shortcomings of Rand's thought, and you would see it in Atlas Shrugged too, it could be described as a plot hole almost, is that there would be a collusion between big business and big government, and it would be much more so than anything Rand portrays between the government and the businessmen. And if one of the major complaints of a libertarian or or a Randian would be against paying taxes. Well, look at the biggest capitalists in the world, look at the biggest companies in the world, and often they do not have to pay taxes. They have deals where they don't have to. Even though the taxes would go to a state that has more welfare programs than Rand would like. So you have the welfare state for everyone except the elites who Either they don't pay taxes or the taxes that they do pay ultimately don't mean much because they've been facilitated by an entire system that is in their pocket, so to speak, from a traditional political point of view. Not to get into the technological system or autonomous technological development outstripping human agency to just leave that to the side for now. So the process Anne Rand describes the system that she hates, it doesn't necessarily throttle the most elite people in society. It doesn't necessarily quell all of the great ideas. It tamps down the middle class. It stops their advancement. Now, maybe it prevents the generation of future elite, but it is not a system that really uh, serves the takers, the looters, as she calls them, Because the lower classes and the working classes who need or want or get welfare, uh, they still remain quite lowly. And yet uh, there are elite people who are able to do anything that they want. Uh, People have described the current situation as the dream and the nightmare, both of uh, Marx. So uh, at the same time, you could say that it's the dream and the nightmare of Ayn Rand also if people like Jeff Bezos, if people like Elon Musk are able to accumulate wealth beyond imagining, if they're able to take these personalized trips into outer space, if they're able to have these big projects 
uh, Ayn Rand would like those ideas. Uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos may seem like almost Randian supermen themselves, and yet the system underneath them is a system that Rand would, would hate. So I think that is an ideological flaw that she doesn't realize how the greatest capitalists can collude or can work with a system that is much more socialistic than what she would like. And that footnote, one of Rand's most famous acolytes, of course, was Ellen Greenspan, who became a very important player in the financial policies of the United States. He was chairman of the Federal Reserve for quite a long time from the Reagan era through the Clinton era and maybe even into the Bush era. So when you're talking about individuals who had the most influence on the monetary policy of the United States, you would have to put Alan Greenspan uh, towards the top of that list. And yet, uh, where is the Randian influence? Does the economic policy of the United States in the late 20th century reflect Ayn Rand's philosophy at all? I think Ayn Rand would have been outraged. Ayn Rand and objectivists and any sort of libertarian-minded people at all tend to be extremely displeased with the financial policies, with the taxation policies in particular, and the social spending aspects as well of the United States government. So I don't see the actual influence. Now, when, when Ellen Greenspan was young, when he was a part of... Anne Rand's uh, reading group coterie, where they would go and just hear her pontificate about certain things in the 60s. Uh, he was completely devoted to her, and I don't know of any break, really, that he had with her or her ideas, but I think that just as, um, as reality unfolds, as electrons move through reality... Electrons, electrons move, move through, through reality. reality. No matter what your philosophy, no matter what the individual outlook, human beings are molded, they are bent towards what the system wants and the development of the technological society itself, that human beings, uh, even the most strident ones, seem incapable of resisting. When Alan Greenspan was young, he would write rebuttals to different publications that gave poor uh, reviews of Ayn Rand's books. How did that person become the same person who is in charge of the money printing at the Federal Reserve? Now, it's true that through Greenspan's tenure, the Fed didn't print or create nearly as much money as they would in the successive years and, and the forthcoming uh, quantitative easing policies, but they still printed money. They still acted in this way that was antithetical to the basic principles of Ayn Rand. There are critics of Ayn Rand who, in their own ways, point to uh, economic policies of the United States government and make it seem as though uh, Randites had completely infiltrated because they see that anything that isn't just a complete spending spree and um, Santa Claus bag, the endless cornucopia endless bottomless pit of freebies and infinite government spending for self-serving government programs is cruel and Anne Randian, but uh, the Randites themselves would completely disagree. And if you look at uh, what the Reagan administration did in particular, they get flack for lowering taxes, but the, the eventual problems of the Reagan monetary policy was that they lowered taxes, but they didn't lower spending, and that's why the deficit, that's why the debt rose. That was the compromise. Reagan didn't get what he wanted or what he said he wanted. He didn't cut the spending. Uh, he just cut the taxes. So when critics hunt and peck for Reagan welfare cuts, they are relatively small. If you look at the broader picture, the government spending didn't stop at all, not just for the military either. I mean for the domestic welfare and social program spending that did not significantly stop at all. In many ways, it rose. So the government's spending more but collecting less tax. Open parenthesis. 
less tax percentage wise of income tax, not necessarily less tax overall. I believe that like JFK before him, Ronald Reagan actually caused an increase in the amount of revenue raised through taxation, lowering income taxes because overall the net effect despite that was that the government was taking in more money. I'm sure there's exceptions to this, but I just wanted to put this um, nuance in there that the government wasn't necessarily taking less tax. It was less uh, percentage of income tax, roughly speaking. Closed parenthesis. Now, uh, the Randites might be somewhat happy with less taxing, but they're more or less against so much of the government spending if not all of the government spending, some of them. So when Alan Greenspan goes to work f for, quote-unquote, for President Reagan, of course he doesn't work for him. The, the Fed is in some ways um, in charge of, of, of all of it. But uh, you can't really say that he brought a Randian influence to the U.S. government. I see no, no evidence of that at all. To suggest that there is evidence of that, you would have to be of the mindset that any tax cut anywhere is uh, cold, cruel, and Randian. And you would have to be of the, of the perspective that not funding any and all social programs, uh, no matter their success, no matter their legitimacy or lack thereof, would be cold, cruel, and Rand. You, you have to spend everything you have to spend as much as possible you have to spend any and all capital even capital you don't have otherwise you get labeled a cold and cruel randy and acolyte that would be the only perspective i can see that would suggest that alan greenspan brought uh, a randy and influence to the reagan administration and the next few uh, administrations afterwards i don't really see it that i'm not saying this to defend Alan Greenspan. I don't particularly like Alan Greenspan, but it shows you how a very ideologically committed young man can be completely molded into a stooge of the system and can be persuaded to just do whatever the pressures of the system, uh, the non-human system, wants. His wife, too, Alan Greenspan's wife, is Andrea Mitchell. She was a longtime uh, reporter for NBC. I don't think she's still on the air. Maybe she is, but it's just all this charade that even people so close to the top of um, human power, you know, if you wanted to name the human beings near the top of the corridors of power, certainly Alan Greenspan was there for several decades at least three or four decades, and yet any sort of insight that he got to the system um, was, was not enough to really change things into the way that he thought they should be. And the person closest to him during that time, his wife, uh, seems to just completely play in to the charade of news media and the show and doesn't really seem to have a uh, much deeper perspective on what is actually going on. Her presentation was always very partisan, seemed to believe that the surface level was pretty much all there was to see anyway. At least that's how she came off. And I, I don't think that she's such a good actress that she could know a lot more about the actual workings of power while still playing such a good role in believing in the two-party system. And believing that individual human beings really had more influence on it than they did when her husband, uh, who would have been one of the very few most influential people in U.S. government monetary policy for two or three decades, seemed utterly incapable of exerting any sort of personal philosophical influence over it. End of footnote. Anne Rand, she doesn't have working class heroes in her book. She doesn't have middle class heroes. Uh, there is an aspiration, which is in some senses is good, but it's an aspiration that 
only the elite matter and that there's a sort of fate accompli by being a white collar worker or a, a rich person. At the same time, she celebrates Hollywood, she celebrates popular culture, and yet maybe from her perspective relatively early on in the process, she couldn't see it, but popular culture uh, would stop celebrating beauty, would stop being an aspirational driver, uh, if it ever was, but Anne Rand, coming from the Soviet Union, looked at it and saw the beauty of Marilyn Monroe, the freedom of maybe a James Dean figure or whoever. And uh, she saw that contrasting quite a lot with the cold uh, socialist realism of the country that she came with. And yet I see no big change in the system, in the culture industry from the 40s to the present. Certainly things have changed, but the system now was inherent in the system then it's the playing out of this dehumanizing process and while someone like theodore adorno would criticize the pop culture of the 40s and the 50s and Anne rand if she were alive today would criticize the pop culture of the present day it's the same system it's it, it really is the same system yes there have been changes but it isn't as though the system has been hijacked as much as this this is the quote-unquote natural processes of the system playing out. And that goes into how Ayn Rand seems to be blind to the impact of technology, blind to the effects of mass media. She doesn't really see the consequences of it, and maybe from her perspective, it would be asking too much for her to foresee all of this. Uh, and yet, why, why is Ayn Rand so hated? Now, I went to her Wikipedia page before writing down the notes that I took, and I was expecting to see a whole litany of racist statements or sexist statements uh, that she had made, and uh, there w there was not much of that. I don't know if perhaps uh, Randian super fans are protecting her Wikipedia page, but I was expecting to see much more criticism of her with juicy quotes about how maybe she didn't like Martin Luther King or something like that, or how the civil rights movement didn't sit well with her, uh, the way just out of principle, a lot of more libertarian oriented people uh, would have just said, well, we don't need these civil rights laws if, if a store owner doesn't want to let uh, certain patrons into their shop on the basis of the color of their skin. Well, that's a that's a stupid thing, but that's the shop owner's right. And the corrective would be simply for the larger community to not patronize that shop if that shop is known as racist. Uh, we don't need these laws to enforce that. That's not exactly what I think, but that's what they think because they have this individualistic outlook. Now, um, I didn't, but I didn't find that on Ayn Rand's Wikipedia page. And I, I, I really, so does that mean that there are no juicy racist sound bites from Ayn Rand. Uh, well, I, I know that she's she argued against uh, the welfare state. She's, she's obviously against that, and I guess that her strident take and her expansive language against the part of society that she calls the looters that has led others to brand her as in, inherently racist. I don't know. I, I don't want to really get into this much other than to say I don't see enough specifics about why uh, she is so hated. I, I think it is simply that her criticisms cut very close to the bone of liberal democracy and uh, the welfare state. And I, I think it's just um, a knee-jerk reaction against her. People say that her books are filled with characters who are caricatures or characters that just represent ideologies and parts of ideologies. But you can say the same for Ibsen. As I've said, you can say the same for Bertolt Brecht. You could say the same for Dostoevsky. I mean, think of the Dostoevsky novels and think of how many times you've heard uh, convenient explanations about how this character represents the spiritual, this character represents the miser, this character represents the old patriarch. This character represents the soldier. 
just because characters more or less can be said to represent different aspects of the culture, that doesn't mean that it's a negative necessarily. And um, Rand has this reputation for being cold and calculating, and yet there's sex in her books. There is passion of all sorts in her books. So I, I, I don't see these criticisms really playing out. I mean, as I've, I've given criticisms of her here, they're criticisms that I've made after reading her books. And I don't think that many of her critics read her books or read very much of them. But I mean, at the same time, I've, I've admitted that I couldn't even read one page of Harry Potter and I have no desire to continue. Uh, I see the way that Harry Potter fans act and I don't want to read Harry Potter. It's just, it's to put it as nicely as possible. It's, it's not my kind of thing. And if people don't, if uh, Anne Rand fans rub potential readers the wrong way, then you don't want to read Anne Rand. Fair enough. But a lot of people act as if they know what's in her books and what is in her philosophy. It's just the same sort of prejudice that I saw in academia and in people that are hanging around academia. They... They just hate anything associated with Republicans. It's a knee-jerk reaction that they make in order to build themselves up. It's like a marker of I'm a good person because, ooh, Anne Rand, she's, she's so mean and probably really racist. Her books are, like, so boring. They don't read her books. They're, they're, I mean, what, what can I say? They're, they're extremely prejudiced people. That it's just one more indication and that's not to say, of course, that Ayn Rand is right about anything, but if you can read Ibsen, if you, if you can put up with the didactic nature of a lot of Ibsen plays, then put up, put up with uh, at least The Fountainhead. I mean, there used to be this whole thing about, well, expand your mind, uh, get different perspectives on things. I guess that's gone out of style amongst the supposedly liberal elites a long time ago. And, but Ayn Rand's novels are compelling. I think her thought is either a good corrective or at least something to keep in mind. I mean, keep in mind that I went to become a Joyce scholar for a while after reading that Ayn Rand hated James Joyce. So I'm, I'm able to keep different perspectives in my mind. And um, I should point out lastly, too, that it seems as though uh, in some ways Anne Rand's novels are sort of like the other side of the coin of Soviet socialist realism, the fiction movement in the Soviet Union. I was going to do a whole podcast on this, particularly on the novel Cement by Gladkov, where the protagonists just seem to be representations of Soviet ideals, the Soviet man, the Soviet woman, the good party members, the party members that fail in certain ways and then are corrected or uh, renounced. That's what you find in um, a lot of the orthodox Soviet era literature. And with Anne Rand, who fled the Soviet Union, you find the Randian man, the Randian woman, and you also find the caricatures of the bleeding heart bureaucrats, the politicians that want to hamstring the march of progress and capitalists, etc. And yet I find Rand's novels much more compelling and with much more passion than the cold, sterile figures of Soviet realism, particularly the novel Cement. The figures in Soviet realism didn't really catch on, and there's not much to say about them. Whereas the Randian characters undeniably cultivated a large fan base, and even the people that hate them have a lot to say about why they're so bad, supposedly, from their perspective. So it's as objective as you can get uh, without being uh, necessarily a an objectivist. It does seem as though Ayn Rand's outlook is at least the superior version of the ideological novel from the mid-20th century when juxtaposed to the truly cold, the truly heartless, uh, the truly calculating, because it must always be revised according to the prevailing political winds and overtones, the tripe of Soviet fiction 
from the same time period, but the people that criticize Ayn Rand for being didactic, for having uh, cold ideological shells for characters, they don't apply that to the output of the nation that she left. All right, now let's get into Thomas Pynchon before my voice completely goes out. I'll, I'm certainly going to have to record more on a different day because I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all this material in this recording session before my voice gives. Thomas Pynchon's reputation in my value-ment, in my value-ment or my valuing of him comes down basically to three books. His first novel, V, his second novel, The Crying of Lot 49, and his third novel, his greatest novel, Gravity's Rainbow. V came out in 1963. It's several hundred pages long. Crying of Lot 49 came out in 1965. It's only about 150 pages long. And Gravity's Rainbow, roughly 700 pages long, came out in 1975. He's produced fiction since then. He's known as a recluse. Nothing that he wrote since then is worth remarking on. That said, I haven't read all of it, so maybe there is a diamond in the rough, but everything I've heard about it, none of it interests me. The critics that continue to talk his more recent novels up seem untrustworthy to me based on other reviews that they've given. It just seems like an, an automatic that you have to praise Pinchon. It's because it does seem like right from the beginning, Pinchon was in some sort of club. He was almost instantly in the literati club. I don't know why. I don't know who pushed him. But it seemed as though he was given a stamp of, of approval by someone. And as good as I think his first three books are, the scene around him, the scene that began to celebrate him and continued to celebrate him for, for a long time when he was past his prime. There's a lot of um, fakeness there. It's the same scene that uh, you know, tried to pretend that mid-century America had a great literary scene when we, we did not. We did not have these uh, grandiose high men of letters, uh, even though the media pretended that people like Norman Mailer People like uh, Gore Vidal, they they pretended like they were these um, literary giants that we had these um, tremendously important figures, and they're they're not. They were very forced. They were very promoted. They didn't. I mean, they they didn't catch on despite enormous amounts of free publicity. Vidal and Norman Mailer did not catch on, hardly at all, ever. And within that expansive push, I think someone like Thomas Pinchon was sort of taken in and um, someone said, we can, we can use this guy. And even when it's, it's just so ab absurd, you still see the remnants of this system today. Uh, even when, it, when um, Thomas Pinchon's more recent books come out, they still say New York Times bestseller. Uh, at, at, at the top, and it's it's so absurd, as if we have a real big reading culture that's reading Thomas Pynchon, new Thomas Pynchon novels at this point, when it's not a thing, it's it's very much not engaged with the culture, especially since most of his novels are historical novels, that's, they really seem irrelevant. From what I've read of them and from what I've read ab about them, they just seem irrelevant in ways that V and Crying of Lot 49 and especially Gravity's Rainbow were not irrelevant and remain much more relevant than Pinchon's recent stuff. But even the very idea that there's, uh, there's absurdities upon absurdities compounded with this New York Times bestseller thing where as if Thomas Pinchon, if you know his reputation, if you value Thomas Pinchon, if you have respect for him, as if you would care about how many copies he sold, as if you would care, as if you would care. Who cares? The value that someone should have if they value Thomas Pinchon should have nothing to do with New York Times bestseller on the top of the book. It's just uh, absurd. And yet Pinchon is, is still 
in this club where his agent or agents have continued to get him a place at the table, even though he's a recluse or pretty much. But anyway, um, V, the novel V from the early 60s was tremendously impressive. It's about um, this supposed conspiracy, historical conspiracy. Maybe we're not really sure. We're not really sure what V is or who V is, but we see different historical scenes from New York, from Italy, uh, across the centuries, and uh, other European locations also in, in other time frames. And the little details that the reader gets, they seem like these little clues that lead towards this larger conspiracy. Uh, and yet, what is the plot? Well, there's no real fucking plot. It's just a lot of illusions, a lot of vignettes, but in your mind, it does seem like it's going somewhere. And even though, and Rand would, of course, hate it, but even though it doesn't really go anywhere, uh, the reader nonetheless seems... Uh, it's it's like exercise. It's like intellectual exercise, and um, the mood is quite good. And there's there was nothing really like it. Um, conspiracy also plays a role in the crime of Lot Forty Nine, uh, Pinchon's next book, uh, much shorter novel, only a little over a hundred pages long. And this novel could and I think has kind of almost fit into the high school novel cookie cutter mold but it, it doesn't quite fit there one because there is um kind of a little too explicit uh, sexual and drug content for uh the 20th century to abide by so it didn't quite fit in it didn't it, it's almost like someone told him hey write a book write a novel that we can put in high school that we could we can ha have the students read uh, the week after they get done reading The Catcher in the Rye or something like that. But Crying of Lot 49, and I think Harold Bloom has said that Crying of Lot 49 might be Pinchon's best book, and I think it's um, it's almost a condensed version of V, and that it's the same kind of ideas. There's a historical conspiracy. We're not really sure what's happening. We're not really sure what the nature of the thing is. Um, the plot is that a woman's ex- lover has been deceased and um, she has to deal with the aftermath and it's almost like he's left clues for her so that she can stumble upon this historical, symbolic, all-pervasive conspiracy that has to do with so many different things uh, from the Rosicrucians to the U.S. mail delivery system, etc., etc., etc. And yet, in V, we're not really even sure what or who V is. In Crying of Lot 49, we're not really sure if the recently deceased man is actually deceased, or we're not really sure. And we're, we're left in a lurch at the end. It's, it's almost like the novel ends right when the protagonist might find out whether she's gone insane and she's completely paranoid, or if um, her ex is still alive, or if the truths, if any, behind these, the seeming conspiracy will be revealed. And it's condensed into 150 pages. Now, um, Pinchon's prose is very clunky. Pinchon's prose is not easy to read. He's one of these writers where you read a sentence and you almost have to reread it. And I find his turns of phrase, I find his diction, I find the way that he structures sentences to be awkward. Uh, not awkward in a way that they can even be revised. Uh, because looking at his sentences, it's like Ayn Rand would say that it's poorly written. And yet, to correct it, you couldn't. It is, it is the perfect form for the voice that it has. And this is unremarked upon. I find Pinchon very, very difficult to read. Um, not necessarily because of obscure words, but because of just the way the sentences are structured. The details that he talks about are... Very strange. The, the descriptions that he gives of what's going on are very confusing. Um, in, I was rereading some of uh, Crying of Lot 49 last night, and there are numerous instances of the characters in the novel doing impressions of like 
cartoon characters or impressions of stock character types that you might see on a television. And the way he describes this, it's, it's, it's very weird. It, he doesn't just come out and say it. It's very um, circumlocutious or, or something. It is, it's very weird. Um, the character will say this odd phrase and then three sentences later, you'll find out that the phrase character one said was an impression. When, char- when you get a, almost an interior monologue from character two, you'll find that out when the third person narrator says something about how character two felt about that. And it's very bizarre. And yet the novel takes on a lot of the pop culture at the time, uh, the radio figures into it. So we're seeing more and more that Pinchon is paying attention to uh, technology, media, electronics, and the paranoid effects of all of this. How these conspiracies, which were in V as well, um, they've now become more frenzied in the minds of our protagonists because of drugs, because of the introduction of mass media technology. That it, that icing on the cake makes the whole thing more disorienting, and. It's a very good novel. It's a very good novel, The Crying of Lot 49. It, I can see where Bloom might think that it's uh, Pinchon's best, but I do think his best is his next novel, his third novel, Gravity's Rainbow. Gravity's Rainbow is set in the aftermath of World War II. Now, whether Pinchon himself would agree with what I've laid out or not, I don't know. But the fact that it's set in the aftermath of World War II, the fact that it has to do with technology, in particular, it has to do with the development of the V2 rocket and other technologies that, some of them hypothetical, although the the V2 was a real thing. It has to do with war, it has to do with technological development, and it's set in the aftermath of World War II. World War II is, as I've been saying, World War II is the demarcation event. World War II is when technological development became autonomous, more or less, when technology usurped human agency. Uh, and that is the era that we're in, where human beings are not the top organism on the planet anymore. It's technology as an organism. Uh, when we talk about the technological society, this is not how Alul really talks about it, I don't think, but it's how I intend the phrase. It's a society composed of technological objects. The technological society is not human society with technology incorporated. It is a society in which the inhabitants are not people. It is a society in which the inhabitants are technological devices. That is the society and we are living in it. Technology is not living in our society. We are living in this society of technology. And um, the winner of World War II, the real winner was technology and technological development. Thomas Pynchon kind of goes along with those themes. He speaks also of uh, the preterites, the passed over ones, and he means that as a subset of humanity. I would say that humanity itself is all preterite. It's all preterite now. We are the passed over ones. We are left behind as uh, the real mover and shakers become technological development itself. Pynchon wouldn't go that far. Pynchon still wants to point crabby fingers at the elite, uh, including Richard Nixon, who provides the opening quote of Gravity's Rainbow. It's just, what? And it's meant to, uh, it's meant to tell you that Richard Nixon doesn't know what's going on. And yeah, Richard Nixon didn't know what's going on. Now, I don't think Richard Nixon knew what was going on in a certain way, and I don't think it's the same way Thomas Pynchon meant it, because Thomas Pynchon, for all of his positive attributes is also a typical American liberal from the mid 20th century on who thinks he's part of a counterculture, even though he's promoted by the biggest book publishers in the world. But um, Nixon didn't really know what he was dealing with. Nixon was, was in office, I think, when Gravity's Rainbow was published, or he was just out of office. I think he was just out of office, but while Pinchon was writing the book, Um, Nixon was in office. 
And um, Thomas Pinchon just wants to point fingers at Nixon and make fun of him. Fair enough, I guess. But um, I think that, you know, Nixon didn't know that the real elite that he was trying to ingratiate himself in were not going to accept it. Nixon didn't know that the game was larger than he thought it was. Nixon was an outsider all of his life. He did, he did everything he could to ingratiate himself to the elite, but he still had some of his own ideas. And because he didn't go along with everything the elite wanted, they, they got rid of him. It's not, it's not a defense of Richard Nixon. I think that the things Richard Nixon did to try to ingratiate himself into the real elite were not good. I don't think taking the U.S. off the gold standard was good. I don't think uh, a lot of... I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but I, I think this, Richard Nixon had serious failings too. But um, Thomas Pinchon and putting that quote in there Mostly a good thing. I mean, I, but I think it's a little dubious, but I do think that the element of someone like Richard Nixon not really understanding the larger historical processes, I think that's important. Even if I think that the larger processes have to do with more of the elite than Thomas Pinchon would have a problem with. And I think that it has to do with an Ellulian sense of technological development, even more than Pinchon seems to be saying in Gravity's Rainbow. But in Gravity's Rainbow, Pinchon does emphasize technological development. He does seem to be saying, this is an epic. This explains something about our world. Uh, The Richard Nixon quote brings it into the the present day, the the audience that he was addressing right then. So he seems to be saying that this is an epic work. It really says something about the era that we're in now. The era that we're in now has to do with the aftermath of World War II, that is the year zero of this new world, and it has to do with technology. And he's, he's right. And there's a, there's a chapter in Gravity's Rainbow, I, there was, I think it's like an anthropomorphized light bulb, and um, we hear the story of the light bulb, and the light bulb means a hell of a lot for our society, of, of, of course. So I think Pinchon is pretty much on track. Now, Again, what is the real story? Well, we follow different characters and as they go through the wasteland of post-war Europe and they have little misadventures. It's, it's almost like a whole mad crew again. The whole mad crew was a phrase that Pinchon put in V as one of the New York-centric bands of characters and it's it's kind it kind of prefigures the hippies the this whole mad crew idea it's all if i would compare it to anything it would be something like um the beat generation but with a with more perspective because the the beats romanticized themselves in ways that pinchon doesn't really romanticize uh these whole mad crew i idea that he has between that and between Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, the the characters of Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, the this the they have these madcap adventures and misadventures, and that is kind of what we see with it. And it's a it's an important concept, and I think V, uh, I think Pinchon portrays it very very well, uh, without the beat overtones, which I have talked about not liking the beat generation very much, and um. The, the whole mad crew that Pinchon portrays, it, that really is how it was. You know, we're in this post-war world. The teenager has become a thing, but there are also these aimless people. It's the start of the extended childhood idea that we're still dealing with more and more to this present day where the people, everybody just seems like a teenager kind of well into their into their old age now even. They're just having these madcap adventures and they're going on a motorcycle and pretending to be a rebel or they're going out partying, you know, it's this whole mad crew. And we have sort of like these mad crews on uh, the European continent post-war. We have these little mad crews and we follow their adventures and misadventures and we hear their speeches and their themes and it's all about technology and S&M works its way in there and the specter of Nazism, et cetera, et cetera, and war and technology and bombs 
and blueprints for super weapons and on and on and on. Is there a story? Is there a real narrative there? Kind of, almost, not quite, not really. Less so even than something like Joyce's Ulysses. Pinchon was influenced by Joyce, particularly by Ulysses. There's a figure in Gravity's Rainbow. I can't remember what the guy's name was, but in some ways he's a stand-in for a James Joyce figure. In Ulysses, we have a story. We have a story in Ulysses. It's a subverted, uh, subvert your expectations story of a, a hero, but it's the story of a day. It's a story of 24 hours. It's the story of a day in the life. And th there is a clear line of what you can say happens in Ulysses and kind of what the implications are. With, with Gravity's Rainbow, it's scattershot. Now, despite that, it's a fucking epic. It's the closest thing to a fucking epic aside from maybe Atlas Shrugged. Those, those are the two contenders. Don't talk to me about Don DeLillo's Underworld, which is sometimes brought up. Harold Bloom brings it up as a possible contender also. And no, Underworld sucks. I think Harold Bloom likes Underworld a lot because there's baseball in Underworld. And no, Underworld does not say very much. Don DeLillo's best book is White Noise. White Noise could kind of be compared to Crying of Lot 49, and Underworld could be compared to Gravity's Rainbow, and yet White Noise works quite well for what it is, and yet um, Underworld sucks. It's just a big bloated mess, and no, it doesn't fucking say anything, or hardly anything. So Underworld sucks. Don't talk to me about that. Don't talk to me about William Gaddis. No, uh, William Gaddis is, uh, I f it slips my mind now, but no, I've read these epics. They're not very good. They're not very epic. It's just something else for the literati to chatter about because they always need to celebrate something. They need to pretend as if the literary canon is as strong as ever and that their little niche, their little clique is able to produce great work just like they needed to pretend that Vidal and Mailer were these great thinkers when no, 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 no. And as, as great as, let me just say, as great as Gravity's Rainbow is, as great as Atlas Shrugged is, they're, they're nowhere close to Ulysses. It's nowhere close to the greatness and the, the literariness of the pre-war books. Nowhere close, nowhere close, nowhere as authentic. Now, could Gravity's Rainbow be as good as the best Virginia Woolf novels? Well, in some ways, it's more impressive, even if it's less authentic. It's less authentic as a piece of literature because it's in post-World War II, where literature itself has been demoted. It's been hardwired demoted in this system because of the rise of technology. It's, it's inescapable because of the rise of technology and its consequences that make the human culture itself more disperse and less authentic. But when you talk about the great works of the modernist era, Finnegan's Wake, Ulysses, Remembrance of Things Past, there is at least the potential for greatness. There, there was the potential for even more. If you go back to the 1800s, Goethe's Faust, Moby Dick, there's nothing after World War II that, that, that equals these. It's, it's, it's impossible, it seems, even if Thomas Pynchon was smarter or knew more factoids than Herman Melville, even if Thomas Pynchon has more very good books than Herman Melville, Moby Dick is authentic in a way that Gravity's Rainbow cannot be and is not. So if we're going to continue on with the criticism, the negative criticism of Thomas Pynchon, um, well, a lot of it really, honestly, has to do with his supporters and his audience is what I would want to talk about. Gravity's Rainbow, when it was originally published, it was published with horizontal rows of squares between the scenes. The scene breaks would be denoted on the page by a row of little boxes, little squares, that led critics to suspect that this was some sort of formal indication that the book is a movie because the lines of squares looked like the sprockets on the sides of film reels. So it's like every scene 
the beginning and end of it is a uh, line of film sprockets. So each scene is like a scene in a movie or something. And uh, I, b I believe that motion picture technology is referred to in Gravity's Rainbow also. I, I, I haven't reread it. I can't remember exactly. But even if it's not, technology itself and less so popular culture is inherent in Pinchon's work up to that point and in Gravity's Rainbow technology is definitely foregrounded. And we're supposed to think about the post-war era, the, the implications of all this. Well, we have the rise of mass media, the rise of film. So because of that formal indication, uh, seeming formal indication, uh, se formal seeming indication, that the scenes of Gravity's Rainbow are in some sense uh, scenes of a movie. This caused readers and critics to really go wild in their speculations. Now, what were their speculations about what this means? Well, they couldn't really say, and typical, and Anne Rand would hate this, because the meaning is not pinned down. It's not pinned down by the author, and it's not pinned down by the readers, and it's not pinned down by the critics who want to make so much of this. And yet it, it seemed to mean something. It seemed to mean that, look, all of our reality now is, some, is in some sense being filmed, being recorded, being processed through technology and made into mass media. At the same time, um, to go back to Richard Nixon... Richard Nixon was brought down because of the Nixon tapes, because the White House itself, uh, the Oval Office was always or almost always being recorded. There was an audio tape. I, there was an audio tape system that automatically turned on. I talk about this in the recording chapter of Warhol Christian. Uh, think about how Warhol constantly had audio tapes with him and was recording and filming everything. There was a factory diary that was basically just filming the factory every single day, no matter what humdrum thing was going on, everything is being filmed. With Chris Chan, we have everything recorded of this person's life. Not everything, but a lot. All, all these embarrassing things. Everything's recorded. Everything's documented. Everything's being... Footnote. It would also play into to the whole reality TV aspect that became so prominent in our culture and the whole film everything uh, social media outlook where everything is filmed, everything's a show. Even in the early 2000s, I would add the Eminem show, the whole concept he had of his life being like a show, but now where everybody's famous, quote unquote, and where everybody's recording and filming their lives. Is it real? Is it a movie? Are you acting for the audience? Are you acting differently because there's a camera? And if Gravity's Rainbow had uh, film sprockets to separate the scenes, then that would lend the book towards this coming idea that became so prominent in the late 20th century and the early 21st because the characters would sort of be on film. Is it real? Is it their real life? Is it a movie? Is there a layer of fakeness pervading everything? And is everything becoming more and more fake and less and less reliably real all the time? Those are the ideas that Pinchon would be getting at and would be presaging in some sense. End of footnote. Even when Chris Chan meets people in the real world, they secretly recorded it. Everything is being filmed. Everything is being documented. We have the we have the paranoia of Richard Nixon. But is he really being paranoid if he is being recorded all the fucking time? If people are out to fucking get him all the fucking time? And we also have paranoia as a big theme in Pinchon's works, especially in The Crying of Lot 49, where the character is very paranoid. Is there really a conspiracy? So these are Pinchonian themes and the sprockets, the, the, what seem to be sprockets to denote the scene changes in Gravity's Rainbow, it seemed, to, it seemed very elusive. I mean, that's another thing about Pinchon's work. The names of people, the ideas, they seem to allude to some greater truth. Uh, the Crying of Lot 49, the main character is Odepa, 
the female version of the name Oedipus. What does this mean? Well, something about Sigmund Freud is in there too, the Freudian psychology. There's a psychologist in there. Her name is Odepa. What does this mean? What does this mean? Or is the search for a greater meaning the wrong tract? Is that just a source of paranoia? None of these things ever reach an end, and the speculation over what the film Sprockets and Gravity's Rainbow meant never really uh, reached an end. No one could really say what it meant, but it seemed to mean so much. And this is what I'm getting at about how the epics, the pseudo-epics of the post-war era, are not true epics because they only seem to mean. Everything seems. That's something Glenn Keeley said once. And it's, it's a simple statement but it says so much about the fucking world that we're in now. Everything seems, it seems to be this way. And that's in Thomas Pynchon, his ideas, the things that are in his books, they seem to mean something, but they don't represent the culture the way Moby Dick represented a culture. They don't represent a civilization the way Goethe's Faust represented a civilization. They were not the real true lifeblood epic of their audience the way that the Iliad and the Odyssey seem to have been the real lifeblood epic of the people uh, hearing and composing the myths in a sort of group authorship way uh, in ancient Greece. And yet we have this, uh, this pseudo-epic, Gravity's Rainbow, that seems to mean so much. And lo and behold, I didn't find this out until a few years ago, in the mid aughts, I think in 2005 or so, it came out that the rows of squares in Gravity's Rainbow were not Pinchon's ideas. They were something arbitrary that the typesetter came up with. So all these years, decades and decades, people have written essays. I think, I'm sure it came up in my essays that I wrote on Gravity's Rainbow, making a lot about, oh, these film sprockets. They, they mean, in some sense, it's all a movie. In some sense, our world is all a movie. They weren't Pinchon's ideas. And since that came out, apparently forthcoming editions of Gravity's Rainbow do not have those squares to demarcate the scene changes. So how do we process this? Well, it's not meaningless, it's not meaningless that generations of scholars and readers and critics were led to think this. The ideas that Pinchon's, um, if you even want to call them Pinchon's squares, the ideas that the, the rows of squares in Gravity's Rainbow had us contemplate, maybe they were worth contemplating. They probably were in many instances, I guess. I don't know how you'd say, but I guess. Um, but also to go back to V, something else like this happened in V. It was discovered just a few years ago that not all editions of V are the same because an edition that came out from a UK publisher after the initial American printing was revised. Pinchon revised some things and he did so for a UK publisher and the typeset or the file or whatever that the UK publisher used was reused by other publishers here and there, but the original American printing, different manuscript, the original, that continued to be used by different publishers too through the years. So there have been competing versions of V. Now, how much was changed? I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't looked into it. I read the original American version, but there's been two different versions for several decades. For like, it seems like for um, almost 50 years and no one noticed. No one seems to have noticed. Pinchon himself didn't even really seem to care. So must be he's tuned out. I, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. He gets done with this work and it's done. But he didn't really seem to think about how, oh, the American version is going to be different. Or is he playing a joke? Did he play a joke? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, if it was Andy Warhol, that's something Andy Warhol could have done to just play a joke on people to see how long it would take for them to notice that there's two different versions of the book. I don't think they're dramatically different, but they're significantly different. Let me tell you, you know, I, I run down different 
people, academics. Let me say this. James Joyce scholars would have noticed. It would not have taken James Joyce scholars 50 fucking years to realize that there's two different versions of a book. They would have found the differences in short order. And yet, these fucking American-centric literati, they are so pretentious, they are so dumb, they are stupid. They're stupid people, they think that they've got these great works, they don't even know what they've got. They don't even know what they've got. But they want to talk shit about Ayn Rand. They don't know what they're looking at, they don't know what it means, they don't know that there's been two different versions of it. Terrible. They're, they're, they're fucking terrible. Pseudo-intellectuals. And they all vote the same way. They think they're smart. They think they're educated. In some ways, they're educated. In some ways, they're smart. But they're such poor scholars. They're very poor. They're poor thinkers. They're poor scholars. They're not careful. They don't know what they're looking at. When I was looking at uh, Crying A Lot 49 last night, and again, it's, it's a great book. It's really great. I, there's a typo in it. There's a typo in it. Crying of Lot 49 came out in 1965. The edition I have was published circa 2000. I guarantee you that if I found a recent printing of Crying of Lot 49, it's still going to have this fucking typo in it. I found at least one, maybe two. There is a squiggle under the typo in my edition. It's the same copy that I read early 2000s. I noticed that when I was 18... And it's never been corrected. I mean, who are these people? Who are these people that work at these publishing companies? Who are these editors? You mean to tell me that no one that worked at Harper's Collins, perennial classics, in, since 1965 has noticed this typo? I mean, it's, it's news if they noticed it and they contacted Pinchon and he told them, no, leave the typo in there. That should be known. That should be news in and of itself. But I've read a lot of Pinchon scholarship and I haven't read that. So I have to assume that either no one noticed the typo or no one cares. And look, Pinchon and I would have problems, but... The criticism I'm giving to Pinchon says, is more directed to the scene around him. The literati. the literati. They hoist these people up as these great, unimpeachable masters when they don't even know what the books are. They don't even know what they mean. They don't know what the text is. It's just ridiculous. And it's been this way since long before I was born, man. I mean, this fucking system has been collapsing the standards have been dropping. I'm talking about the people that think that they are the standard. I'm talking about the people that went to Ivy League schools. They think they're the intelligentsia. And it's hard not to have total contempt for them. It really is. They're so pretentious. They're so hypocritical. And they're so dumb. The, the scholars, scholars. The journalists. The journalists. They're so bad. They are so poor. The scholarship is so poor. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're just pretentious, prejudiced pieces of shit for the most part, except for my own audience or except for anybody that I can get a job from in the future. As I've said, after Gravity's Rainbow, uh, Pinchon's quality just fell off a cliff. He did a book called Vineland. Was it 1985 or 1990? Vineland. Uh, and um, Harold Bloom doesn't like Vineland either. It's kind of like it has somewhat cyberpunk overtones. It might be influenced by William Gibson, maybe. But I didn't get much out of Vineland. And I tried to read Mason and Dixon, which came out in, I think, 98. And that it's just uh, the first of a series of historical novels that Pinchon wrote. And I, I didn't get much out of it. I really didn't get much out of it. It just seems to be he lost his touch. He lost his engagement with the zeitgeist. He lost his demon. Damon Daimon stopped working well for him. This is recording session like four or five as I try to finish this. So in 1990, Pinchon released the novel Vineland, which was a major decline. Harold Bloom 
uh, basically said that he fell off at that point. And uh, like I think I said earlier, from the 90s onward, he just um, completely fell off. His books were irrelevant. He lost touch with the zeitgeist, and he lost his, uh, I would say, inner demon. He lost his inspiration. I read Vineland. It was barely okay. I tried to read Mason and Dixon, which came out in the 90s, and I didn't get very far. It was very boring. I never heard anything interesting about it, and the same goes for the novels that he's released ever since. He's released three or four others, and nothing I hear about them makes me want to read them or gives me the impression that he's back uh, on a good track. He appeared on The Simpsons, or he lent his voice to The Simpsons in the early to mid-2000s for two or three episodes, and that in and of itself, probably a lot of you are not going to understand where I'm coming from. Maybe some of you will, but that in and of itself, that decision uh, made me like not, not trust Thomas Pinchon ever again. From that point on, it's like he has bent the knee. That's not to say that The Simpsons were completely terrible, but if you're going to make a list of the, of the media productions that have had the most malignant effect on the culture over the last 35 years... The Simpsons would be near the top of that list. Even though the earlier seasons, okay, you could say, yes, these were good, these are fun, there's some quality, there's some goodness here. But certainly by the early 2000s, it had become clear that The Simpsons were creatively bankrupt, that they were basically harming the culture, that their non-sequitur humor was just... um, dysfunction, mental dysfunction personified. Uh, The ratings declined, you know. It's not as though it was catching on, but it was propped up and continued as a cultural institution in some sense because of what it meant. And uh, you could say a lot of TV shows fall into that category. And Maybe, for all I know, all Thomas Pinchon ever saw of The Simpsons were were the earlier seasons when they were okay. I I don't know what Thomas Pinchon's personal consumer history with The Simpsons is, but certainly by the early 2000s it had become apparent that anyone with any taste at all did not approve of The Simpsons. What? And yet Pinchon, in a shocking decision for someone who is so reclusive lent his voice to the simpsons i i really don't like that i i really have to say uh i mean i'm trying to compare this guy to the greats of the western canon and it it just becomes a laughing stock it it really does for him to bend the knee to the medium um, that did so much harm to the culture uh, particularly to the literary sensibility that he at one time seemed like a part of and a uh, continuer for, or whatever you want to call it. And around the same time, a a quote or a passage from uh, one of his new books was used on The Daily Show. I don't know, I haven't looked into this much, I, I never heard about this at the time, but like I was saying about The Simpsons, if you're going to make a list, a short list of the media productions that did the most harm to the culture. The Daily Show would also be very high on the list. It made a joke of everything. It turned out a lot of smart fools. The effect on the discourse was absolutely terrible. And it's ironic in a sense because the way that Jon Stewart got his uh, start as a political player, as a uh, political pundit, as someone who was supposedly speaking truth to power, he appeared on the CNN program Crossfire, which was a program in which um, two left-wing people, two liberals and two conservatives, usually would hash out the debates of the day. And Jon Stewart was a guest on that program, and he did this big um, show-stopping scene of calling both sides out for what they've reduced the culture to 
and this is one of the tropes that has become endemic and I think is I think is much worse than the strident partisan is the person who who pretends to be a centrist when he isn't uh, pretends to be open-minded when he very much is is not and th that's what John Stewart went on to do himself he called out the CNN crossfire cast for poisoning and lowering the discourse and yet that is just what the Daily Show itself did under the guise of being really smart and witty. And uh, I don't know, I mean, at, at the same time, I mean, who were the conservatives at the time? Who were the conservatives that Harold Bloom, too, didn't like? Well, the prominent conservatives were the neocons. And a lot of what the neocons were doing, especially with foreign policy, it, pretty easy to call out fault on that. So perhaps Pinchon himself was caught up in that and saw The Daily Show as speaking truth to power, even as it lowered the discourse and uh, gave rise to the, the snarky know-it-all who, uh, for some reason, they get almost everything that they want, and yet they're never happy and the world never really goes their way. Perhaps Pinchon was just really caught up in anti-Bush sentiment. I don't know, but anyway, he lent a quote of a forthcoming book to The Daily Show for them to present. And that, that too, I mean, um, when he throws in with The Simpsons post-2000, when he throws in with Jon Stewart's Daily Show, it's hard to maintain respect for him. One of the novels, uh, the more recent novels that he had was called Bleeding Edge. And one of the characters, and I, I haven't read this novel, it's about the run-up to September 11th, 2001. Um, the book takes place, I think, mostly uh, in 2001, before September 11th, and that is kind of like the culmination of the book. But one of the characters in it is, um, quote, I'm quoting Wikipedia, um, trusted source Wikipedia that speaks truth to power. One of the characters in the Pinchon novel, Bleeding Edge, is March, a blogger who leans towards low-level conspiracy theories, but nothing close to truth or ideas, unquote. So we go from the earlier novels, we go from V and we go from The Crying of Lot 49, in which Pinchon is not afraid at all to present and hint towards the concept of far-reaching conspiracies, historical conspiracies, wide-ranging conspiracies involving actors, let's say actors, of false history, the government mind-controlling people. And V, at least, was before JFK's assassination and The Crying of Lot 49 was in the wake of it. Certainly, deep historical conspiracies play a role in Gravity's Rainbow. Also, his earlier work, his greatest works, all point towards this concept uh, that there may even be a metaphysical conspiracy going on that is all pervasive and huge. But and yet in this more recent novel that is pointed towards 9-11, in which he includes a conspiracy theorist as a character, there is nothing in it. He, he does not take this opportunity to question the narrative of this controversial event at all. So Thomas Pinchon seems to have been completely neutered, very much neutered. So we, we have this veneer of the conspiracy theorist and, ooh, maybe there's a conspiracy, maybe, uh, maybe something uh, untoward is, is, is happening. But it's a lot like uh, the Michael Moore movie from around the same time, Fahrenheit 9-11, in which, oh, he calls the Bush administration out on a conspiracy, but he doesn't go too far. He's, he's not a truther. And just like this more recent Thomas Pinchon book, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to go into conspiracies and it's going to be kind of about 9-11, but don't worry, we're not going to go off the plantation. Don't worry, we're not going to go too far. Footnote. The term is controlled opposition which I'll use later on also. But Michael Moore's controlled opposition or functions that way. Michael Moore functioned as controlled opposition, whether he knew it or not. It was a, a safe play to a limited extent that was never really going to 
shake the pillars of the presidency or the operating terms, uh, the terms and conditions of the government software. Open parenthesis. There's also the term limited hangout. You provide a small amount of truth in order to placate curiosity while hiding and dissuading investigations into more important truths uh, for the power structure. And Fahrenheit 9-11 was also sort of like a limited hangout where when people think about conspiracies about 9-11, they think, oh, you mean the, the Bush family and their business dealings with the Saudis, right? Such small-minded shit. But yeah, ab about 9-11, I don't have any uh, particular viewpoint or explanation on it other than the important thing is just that the official story doesn't make any sense and there's there's a number of aspects that are extremely extremely dubious and unlikely but with Michael Moore all of the dubiousness just uh amounted to relatively small ball things closed parenthesis end of footnote it even makes me question, I mean, this, this um, intellectual cowardice, it's part of why, of course, Thomas Pinchon is still in the club. He's still in the club. You can tell that by the New York Times bestseller banner at the top of all of his books, where he's still in the club where he can, he can get that banner as if it should mean anything. But he's in the club. He's not going to question anything really worth questioning. And it, it causes me to think back to the earlier novels that were about uh, conspiracy questioning to no small extent and secret societies, clues, historical evidence of a conspiracy amongst the elite to subjugate the human race. And it makes me think, uh, it makes me question, were those conspiracies really meaningful in those novels? In what Thomas Pynchon was drawing out, was it just irrelevant stuff and nonsense that seemed cool, but is anything in V all that meaningful to the real world? Is anything in The Crying of Lot 49 beyond the surface level stuff about MK Ultra? Is anything in there really relevant? Does it really cause the reader to question their reality? Does, it, does, does even Gravity's Rainbow cause us to question the U.S. government in any way that is remotely dangerous. I mean, it leads off with uh, the Richard Nixon quote, what? So right there, oh, we're, we're questioning the president. But does questioning a president, especially questioning a president like Richard Nixon, who is made to be questioned the same way George W. Bush was made to be laughed at, does questioning Richard Nixon that way, does, is, isn't that just for the people to blow off steam, uh, the same way they can point to Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton's uh, sexual oversteps and just point and laugh and guffaw. And yet it, it's kind of like when the matador holds the flag for the bull. Toro, Toro, here you go. Go after this flag. Here, uh, make fun of Bill Clinton. Here, uh, Talk about how uh, Richard Nixon was a was a clueless, dubious idiot. Here, talk about how uh, George W. Bush is just a moron. Talk about how uh, Joe Biden's senile. All these all these clueless buffoons. That, that zany Nancy Pelosi. Does that really do anything? I don't think that it does really much of anything in and of itself. And I don't know if I don't know that the earlier Pinchon novels really penetrate uh, beyond, you might even call it controlled opposition. Here's your little playpen. Here's your intellectual playpen. You can have these, you can think about these virtually irrelevant, fictitious conspiracies and historical symbols, most of which Pinchon just invents. Does it really yield a deep understanding or a deep questioning of the way things are? I'm not so sure. And yet it has to be said that even if the answer is no, Thomas Pynchon is still, for his part, probably the best American-born novelist of the second half of the 20th century onward to the present.
So in closing, yeah, at the end of the day, Atlas shrugged just edges out Gravity's Rainbow oh. simply because Gravity's Rainbow has now removed those square notches uh, that did not represent film sprockets. Even if Thomas Pinchon and the typesetter said that they were not intended by the author, that they were not intended to indicate film sprockets, if they had left them in almost as a happy coincidence, a faux joli or whatever you want to call it, if they had just left them in and sort of given their approval and allowed them to live in the text still, I would have given it to Gravity's Rainbow. I would have said Gravity's Rainbow because of those square notches, because of the, the meaning that could be there. Uh, I would have given the gold to Gravity's Rainbow because of that potential, but it's, it's not there, and because they have denied that, I think that that diminishes Gravity's Rainbow just a bit, and Atlas shrugged for all its didactic obnoxiousness, as some people might say. I, I don't see a better novel. Footnote. And if that makes people mad, then, hey, maybe you deserve to be mad. <laughs> I think that Ayn Rand should be shoved in people's faces. I think that it's good to just tweak people off because you can't surpass her. I think people should be informed. She's been the best since World War II. If you don't like it, fuck you. She had the right idea. How's that? That makes you mad? Good. I don't even agree with her. I don't even agree with her ultimate sentiments, but... I think it's a good corrective. How's that? Oh, you suck. End of footnote. There is also Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, which is very good. That's a novel of uh, magical realism. 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez is also quite good. And uh, The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass is another big book that's pretty good. But I don't see those novels as wide-ranging or as impressive, frankly, as Gravity's Rainbow or Atlas Shrugged. There is, of course, the caveat of 1984, but 1984 is in a class all by itself. In some ways, 1984 is the perfect novel. The perfect novel in terms of uh, the second half of the 20th century classroom reading. And yet... George Orwell is not as good a writer. I don't know. It's not an epic. Whatever uh, 1984 is, it's the perfect example of its kind, and yet it's not really an epic. It's a few days later, and I'm reading an annotated edition of American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Believe it or not, I'm reading Neil Gaiman, and I'm liking it. Uh, but anyway, in the margin, that t uh, there's, a, there's a note in the margin that talks about Thomas Pynchon's Vineland. Because apparently when the Vikings came to North America, uh, their name for the continent was analogous to the term Vineland. In the note, they say uh, Thomas Pynchon's 1990 novel Vineland explores a dark America in the 1980s a, quote, scabland garrison state, unquote, where dissent is sought out and destroyed and the counterculture is suppressed, end of the note. And uh, kind of ironic, don't you think? I mean, where, when was the counterculture actually suppressed? Where and how was the counterculture suppressed when most people would look at the state of affairs in the 21st century in America and they would say that the counterculture of the second half of the 20th century one, rock and roll, one, the subversion, one, the counterculture became the culture, etc. The explanation for this, of course, is that the counterculture, the supposed counterculture itself, was aided and abetted by large, powerful factions of the elite, of the government, etc. It brings to mind the book by Theodore Rosak, The Making of a Counterculture, the subtitle was Reflections on the Technocratic Society and its Youthful Opposition, as if there, which, 
On the one hand, the title of the book lets you know that the counterculture was a manufactured thing, but the subtitle makes it seem as if the use, the youth, <laughs> useful, I, that's a Freudian slip, useful, youthful opposition. It makes it seem as if the youthful opposition was opposed to the technocracy when really the technocracy aided the counterculture. Uh, just look at, uh, I mean, a, a good example of this is the, the Whole Earth Catalog. The guy behind the Whole Earth Catalog, what was his name? John something. God damn it, I can't remember his name. Footnote. I was thinking of John Brockman, but I got him confused with Stuart Brand. John Brockman was a similar figure who strode between the counterculture scene from the 60s on, uh, but also was involved with high finance and was an establishment figure uh, to no small extent. Uh, he apparently had had or has connections to Prince Andrew and Epstein. Uh, I would recommend a naive but interesting uh, 2003 documentary called The Net or Das Nets, maybe, because it's a European production. It's mostly about the Unabomber, but it gets into all of these um, tangential counterculture figures uh, such as John Brockman and such as Stuart Brand, who they're counterculture and they're hippies, but they're also part of the culture, part of the establishment, and part of what is called, in a broad context, cybernetics, using technology to control people, even as there's a surface level appearance of freedom and art. End of footnote. But um, he was into computers. He was one of the early proponents of computers. And there's a huge link between the hippie culture and the technocracy, the computer revolution. Were there real hippies? Was there a real side of the counterculture that was suppressed? Sure. Uh, were there good things within the counterculture revolution? Uh, the, the, you know, would I call them good? Some things, sure, yeah. But uh, it was largely a con. Not that the counterculture went exactly the way that the CIA wanted or planned, but they certainly commandeered it and used it to their advantage. And the fact that Thomas Pynchon doesn't, doesn't see that, I mean, what, what does he think? Does he think that in the 80s, uh, the Reagan administration and the start of the Bush administration, does he think that they really crack down on the counterculture? I mean, um, really, when it comes down to it, what we call the counterculture just rode the wave of the technological advance. And when you stop thinking about things in terms of human beings being in charge and start thinking about autonomous technological development, including technique, it all just feeds into the development of technique. And what is counterculture? What does counterculture have to be? Whether it's um, somewhat the counterculture of memes and the 2016 4chan wave, or whether it's the 1960s or whether it's Elvis in the 50s, counterculture has to be cool, has to seem cool, has to seem edgy. Well, edginess and coolness is itself technique. Edginess and coolness is technique. It's an aspect of technique. It feeds into the larger technological wave. It's a technological advance it always feeds into something that will help the system in, in the long run. And you can say something like, the hippies from the 60s that I knew, they didn't get what they wanted. They were fucked over by the U.S. government. But their example fed the system. Their, their example became propaganda. And the overall system took elements of it and incorporated it. Same thing with the 2016 stuff. If you want to go there with Trump and the memes, the, the meme culture that seemed to flower in 2016, on the surface level, it looks like the system put the kibosh on that. But it incorporated the techniques into itself. It incorporated meme culture into itself. Footnote. Like the Dark Brandon thing. 
And even if the right doesn't really like the memes of the left, the left never liked the memes of the right either. <laughs> you know, I mean, I would say that, yeah, overall, the memes of the right are much better than the memes of the left recently when we're defining memes specifically as internet memes. But the system learns, and the system has made a lot of goofy anti-Trump memes in the last few years. Open parenthesis. The larger aspect of this would be how initially the memes were supposedly subversive, but then at some point uh, the memes that the dissidents would post, they would be a way of placating the dissidents themselves and tricking themselves into thinking that they've won. You know, they've lost ground in reality, but they've won the meme war, etc. And that's how possibly without any thought on the part of the powers that be, uh, the workings of the system itself and how media interacts with group psychology, the continued presence and the addiction of the memes became a way of neutering and placating the subversives themselves. Open bracket. That's part of why I called the first episode of this podcast the zero episode contra memes because I uh, crabbily recognize the self-limiting deceptive behavior of memes lately and wanted to make something that was very non-meme-like. Closed bracket. Closed parenthesis. End of footnote. And I know that's a simplification, but there you have it. I mean, it's beyond Thomas Pynchon. It's beyond the Thomas Pynchon of the 80s of 1990 when Vineland was released to uh, see the nuance of it. He's still thinking of it in terms of us and them. He's thinking about it in terms of the good guy, lefty, anti-war protester who just wants freedom versus the mean old conservative capitalist government that wants to put the kibosh on everything, but it's a lot more complicated than that. And that kind of dichotomy, even thinking about it, is outdated. And it was outdated even in the 60s and especially in the 70s when Pinchon was writing his better works, but it wasn't as apparent back then. George Orwell wrote an essay called The Prevention of Literature, published in 1946. And in this essay, even then, even right immediately after the Second World War, he was already, as is well known, making an indictment against England and, to a lesser extent, the West in general, about the bullshit propaganda he had been witnessing, not only during World War II, but during the Spanish Civil War, in which at first he fought on the side of the communists. And then he left because he noticed uh, too many problems, too many lies on their side. And then he wrote Animal Farm and 1984. Everybody knows that. But this essay... The Prevention of Literature. It talks about the preconditions that need to be in place in a society for great literature, great writing to arise. And I'm going to read some quotes from it, some blurbs, and respond to it. But first, I want to give my own ideas about why literature, in particular prose literature, which is what Orwell is primarily focused on, why it is based on truth and why truth and honesty have to be necessary ingredients or preconditions in a society for literature to arise. Unlike other art forms, literature is a one-to-one. -one. The code is the presentation. When we examine other media, the audience does not need to understand how the presentation was made. When you watch a movie, you don't need to know 
film techniques. Most people, when they're watching movies, are not even consciously aware of the different camera angles and why they were chosen. They just straightforwardly consume. You don't need to know how to play the guitar or even what different instruments sound like, what sound came from what instrument, what key they're in, what time the song is in. You don't need to know any of that to enjoy music. You need to know it to create music, to compose an opera or a rock song or a computerized music piece. You need to know techniques that your eventual audience does not need to know. When you're a painter, you need to know how to mix the paints to get certain colors. You need to know how different brushes can be used, different materials, uh, what different canvases can provide. When you view a painting, you don't need to know any of that. You just take it in. When you play a computer game or use a computer program, you don't need to know the coding that the programmers use to create that work for you. But with literature, with reading and writing, it's a one-to-one. -one. The code is the presentation. To be able to read is to be able to write. When you're reading, in a sense, you're decoding the end result that the writer put out there. The code and the presentation are the same with literature. I know there's nitpicks around that. You could say that the reader doesn't know the life experience that the writer went through to get to the point where he wrote what he wrote, etc. Doesn't matter. In a basic sense, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the production and the consumption. The code of this medium, literature, is the same as the presentation. It's right there. The linguistic code is the presentation that you read. Compare that to computer code, compare that to the notation that a composer writes down, compare that to the knowledge that you need to play a musical instrument or mix paints in a certain way. With literature, with reading, it's a one-to-one, -one, fluid, honest transference. The reader is right there in the mind of the writer. So honesty is very close to the heart of literature and the scene of composition and consumption of literature. Contrast that to where we are as a people. Our civilization is based on so many lies now, so many half-truths that have compounded that we cannot really be honest with ourselves. And we can go through history and we can argue when the lies began what the lies exactly are, these lies but not those other ones, these historical truths but not those historical mistruths. We all know that the lies and the bullshit is compounding. That is why, especially in the last 80 years or so, it has been almost impossible for great writing to be produced because it has become increasingly difficult for us to be honest with ourselves. Our civilization rests on principles and half-truths and mistruths and outright bullshit. More and more and more instances of them where we cannot have an honest discussion. So now I'm going to turn to Orwell's essay, and I'm just going to read several blurbs from it. Orwell's essay, The Prevention of Literature. The atmosphere of totalitarianism is deadly to any kind of prose writer, though a lyric poet might possibly find it breathable, end quote. Substitute for lyric poet, pop star. Substitute for lyric poet, movie maker. The arts that have more to do with bullshit, the arts that have more to do with razzle-dazzle, can still, for a time, kind of function in a climate of lies. But for prose, for straightforward, one-to-one, -one, the code is the presentation kind of stuff, it's impossible. That's why there's no prose masterpieces. But you can still say, hey, um, the Beatles had some masterpiece albums, right? Hey, there was still some good movies until the late 20th century, right? Yeah, well, as Orwell said, a lyric poet, and figuratively, a lyric poet is a movie maker, a pop star. Next quote, Orwell. 
the imaginative writer is unfree when he has to falsify his subjective opinions. Yet everybody has to uh, put on a public face and pretend in public that they believe in a lot of bullshit. Otherwise, they get canceled. And it's not a new phenomenon. If he is to switch his allegiance at exactly the right moment, he must either tell lies about his subjective feelings or else suppress them altogether. This is the phenomenon. And again, Orwell is writing this right after World War II. This is the phenomenon of people always have to be a part of the current thing. In 1984, it was, we were never at war with East Asia, blah, blah, blah. Oh, we were always at war with East Asia. That kind of a thing. And we've all gone through and witnessed sea changes of what we're supposed to think about different aspects of the world in the last few years. People change on cue. Footnote. Case in point is the Russian hysteria, where for 60 years in popular culture and in political science and in news journalism, the very idea that Russia could be trying to sow seeds of discord in Western internal affairs would be derided as a paranoid fear. But then six years ago, everything changed. And the same sort of wild accusations that we saw cartoonish caricatures of Joe McCarthy make in popular culture for so long, suddenly real people began making similar accusations about anyone who expressed dissent regarding pretty much anything the way that the current thing was going. And many of the people making those paranoid accusations, many of those people lived through the last half century plus, where even during the Cold War, suspicions about Russian agents within the United States were often laughed at, and they certainly were caricatured in pop culture since 1990, when it was even safer to portray fear of Russian interference during the Cold War as completely groundless. End of footnote. And... When you're a prose writer and you're trying to set down something important that defines or tries to describe a place and an era, how can you do that when there are so many external pressures on you to always step with the current thing and change your opinions based on the news or else be canceled? Next quote, the despotisms of the past were not totalitarian. Again, Orwell is writing this right after World War II, and he is not talking about necessarily the totalitarianism of the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. He is talking about the West immediately after World War II. What is he talking about? The despotisms of the past were not totalitarian. What is the thing that makes them totalitarian now? The thing that makes them totalitarian, the thing that gives the potential for total manipulation, full-spectrum dominance, is technology, is communications technology. That's what makes it possible. When you think of totalitarianism, don't necessarily think of some warmonger or um, Genghis Khan or someone like that from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Totalitarianism is preconditioned on there being a potential for total control or nearly total control of human life. Only technology makes that possible. Only media technology and electric, if not electronic technology, even gets close. So that is why the post-war West is totalitarian. The word itself doesn't even necessarily mean cruel. Think of the capacity at first for total intrusion. And unless you are physically captured, which, you know, some people in the past were, But unless you're physically captured, the only thing that can capture the consciousness is media, electronic media. Footnote. And it should be noted that these things in lots of ways do not compare to the great hardships that authors of the past went through. I mean, in the case of Dante, he was exiled. So just broadly speaking, it's it's not as though 
people are going through personal hardships the way that a lot of people in Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union did. It's not that bad yet, <laughs> but the point is about the society itself and the totalitarian aspects of it, the totalizing aspects that create an atmosphere. As I said, totalitarianism doesn't necessarily mean overt cruelty, but it's the atmosphere that makes the situation impossible for uh, the literate mindset, the literary mindset to emerge and flourish. End of footnote. Next quote from Orwell, just a half sentence like circled. He speaks of the emotional sincerity that literary creation demands. Yeah, that you've got to be sincere. Even if you're James Joyce with a persona of a shithead, of a rebel outcast, you need to be sincere at it. And how can you be sincere even in your opposition, even in your rebel stature, if the current thing is constantly changing? You can't. There needs to be an emotional sincerity. Next quote. It is easy for the politician to make such changes. For a writer, the case is somewhat different. Yeah, again, and yet we're all... Um, the, the people have become as corrupt as the politicians. And I, I believe we've even surpassed them now. It used to be that the politician would say anything to get ahead. Well, now the people themselves will say anything to get ahead. The people are corrupt too. They'll say anything to survive. And a writer of great literature cannot be constantly doing that. Obviously, some writers have changed their opinions over time. Leo Tolstoy certainly did. But when Leo Tolstoy changed his opinions on art, it was a long, big, gradual, momentous thing. Today, people change their minds constantly. And that's why nothing they write can last. Next quote. Whenever there is an enforced orthodoxy, or even two orthodoxies, good writing stops. Yeah, it doesn't need to be one orthodoxy. Footnote. The second orthodoxy that we have right now, you might say, is the anti-woke stuff. The supposedly conservative sphere, which has its own orthodoxy, of course. End of footnote. The point really even, isn't even um, the orthodoxy so much as it is the totalitarianism. You can get great writers that survive even if the writing was produced during the height of the Catholic Church's power in Europe. The writing still survives, even amongst people many centuries later who are not Catholics. But you can't get it if the orthodoxy is enforced. See, that's the thing. Whenever there is an enforced orthodoxy, and the totalitarianism definitely helps with uh, the obnoxious enforcement. Next quote. The fact is that certain themes cannot be celebrated in words, and tyranny is one of them. Yes, absolutely. That's also why there is not a national epic of post-World War II America, or even 20th century America. Is it going a little bit far to say we've been living under tyranny? Perhaps, but we've been living under totalitarianism. We've been living under emerging totalitarianism. And you don't even need to get political. The totalitarianism is the media and the artificiality infiltrating every aspect of life. That's a tyranny. You can't celebrate it. How can you write an epic? How can you write an epic, a literary epic, celebrating this? When what this is, what this society is, is the eradication of humanity and the humanities itself. Next quote. German literature almost disappeared during the Hitler regime. Yes. Yes, German literature almost disappeared when Hitler was in power. What happened in the Soviet Union? Well, we had uh, Soviet socialist realist novels, none of which were very good. Now... Bulgakov wrote Master and Margarita. Bulgakov was communist. Master and Margarita was good. Footnote. The Master and Margarita was more magical realism than socialist realism, though. That's an important difference. But there was a good novel or two written by Russian communists, but not those operating under the socialist realist mindset 
I don't think uh, Master and Margarita really qualifies since there's a anthropomorphic cat in it. So the fantastical nature of the work kind of um, escapes somewhat the limiting aspects of usual Soviet novels. End of footnote. Almost everything else was total trash, including cement. This novel that I've talked about, Gladkov's Cement, this was like the best they had, and it was it was shit. It was orthodox. It believed in the Soviet way of life, and it's it was shit. It required constant updates because the Soviet outlook, the current thing over there, had to be updated. But yeah, I mean, look at it. During Hitler, German literature stopped pretty much. During the Soviet Union, Russian literature almost immediately stopped, and Russian Russian literature up through the early 1900s was amazing was amazing. And then during the Soviet era, it's it stopped. Did it come back afterwards? Well, no, because we've been infused with technology and the, the other totalitarianism, you know, a different blend of uh, or brand of totalitarianism in Russia. They swapped out Soviet totalitarianism for the emergent technology that also has an anti-human effect. But yeah, so no no great literature during Nazi Germany, no great literature during the Soviet Union, and no great literature in the in the West after World War II either. Precious little. Last quote. This is now this is George Orwell in 1946. Disney Films, he says, quote, he speaks of Disney Films. And he calls them, quote, essentially a factory process. He is denigrating Walt Disney Animation in 1946. And he is saying, he is calling essentially a factory process. He is pointing to the artistry of Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company. And he is saying, he is giving it a negative judgment. And I say, yes, absolutely. This is what I was talking about in one of my older podcasts that as much as people complain about woke Disney now, the Walt Disney Company was always destroying culture. And Orwell saw it in 1946. And people now look back and say, I mean, I've had to deal with people in in real life. Disney wasn't always this way. Well, they weren't always, quote, woke, but Disney was always a destroyer of culture. Disney was always inhuman. So... I'm I'm glad that George Orwell could see that. But I I bring all this up because I talked about David Foster Wallace and all these recent American writers. This is why they can't produce epics. This is why they cannot produce great works. Because of the lies that we're living with and living under, the half truths and mistruths that we cannot admit to ourselves or to others. So we cannot fashion a literary work much less a movement of them that celebrates this culture because this culture is a totalitarian culture, largely because of its technology, but also because of the bullshit political ideas that we have to live with that don't make any sense and that make less and less sense as um, reality unfolds. And they're compounding. Which mistruths am I talking about? Take your pick. Take your pick. It doesn't really matter doesn't really matter which ones because everybody alive here knows that there's a lot of bullshit. More, perhaps, than in any other time in history. Yes, other eras had their own lies, but the lies of the Catholic Church or the lies of, I don't know, the African tribe or the myths, truths of Greek mythology as an explanation for reality were comparatively few and elegant compared to the obnoxious compounding mistruths of the ruling regime in the West. Every year, there's a ton more bullshit that we have to pretend we believe in. I want to say a quick word, too, about Michelle Holebeck, who is my favorite living novelist. Probably second would be Paul Auster. I think he's still alive. Footnote. Third would be 
the British author David Peace, or maybe he counts himself as Japanese now. I think he's lived in Japan for a long time, but he's from England. The Red Riding Quadrilogy by David Peace is fantastic. It's about Yorkshire in the 70s and the 80s, and it's really a sweeping stream of consciousness masterpiece. Uh, it's really, really masterfully done as much as almost any modernist, uh, you know, early 20th century stream of consciousness work. But it, it takes David Peace, I don't know, over a thousand pages to accomplish what, let's say, Virginia Woolf could accomplish in two or three hundred pages. That said, the Red Riding Quadrilogy, the names of the books are 1974, 1977, 1980, and 1983. They're about crime in Yorkshire, and they're very depressing. They're very gruesome. They're very repetitive, but they're also very, very, very good. And uh, they're really spectacular. I mean, I might, I haven't read anything that David Peace wrote besides the Red Riding books. I suspected if I read more, I wouldn't like him as much. So I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to because I just want to leave it. Probably I like it in particular because I lived in Yorkshire for three or four years. So I, I like the area. I know, I know the scene. But because it's a recent novel in an age when literature doesn't matter as much, does it matter no matter how masterfully it's done? I don't know, but it, it isn't meaningless. It's tremendously meaningful. So the Red Riding quadrilogy, they made a trilogy of films because they left 1977 out of the films, but the, the films are pretty good too. But the novels and the audiobooks of David Peace's uh, Red Riding books, are fantastic. End of footnote. I like Michelle Holabeck. But I don't think that he really rises to the level of the greats of the past. A book like Submission, I had a good time reading Submission. I think it said and probably still says something about the contemporary world. And yet, how would you compare Submission to the great authors of the past? To me, I would say Submission is as good as a third-rate Fyodor Dostoevsky novel. It's as good as maybe House of the Dead, I suppose. Um, I mean, all of Holabeck's work, no matter what the page length is, and usually they're not too long, they all seem more like novellas than novels. I have a good time reading them. It's not as if there aren't profound ideas in them, but they do not seem substantial enough. The Elementary Particles is really good. I enjoyed the novel Serotonin, from a few years ago, that was the most depressing novel I think I've ever read, especially the scenes where the protagonist and his protagonists are all almost the same. They are intellectual losers. They are part of the problem, neoliberal parts of the problem, I guess you could say. But when the protagonist is meeting with the French farmers, um, particularly his old friend, and the farmers stage a protest against the um, EU policies that the French government is going along with to basically destroy them. Those scenes were incredibly moving, so I think Serotonin was a really great work, really good. But is it as good as Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky? No, it's not. But I have to mention Holbeck because... There is still some life left. It's not as though everything today new is universally terrible.
said he went to, through almost 2,000 books for 20 sheets of notebook paper filled with notes. That's how well it was hidden. How many people have a set of encyclopedias at home, a good set? So home tonight, look up the word Illuminati. In some of the encyclopedias, you will find that it existed but does not exist now. And in other encyclopedias, you will find that it existed and still exists now. But they don't tell you anything about it. Before we go into it, I want to give you a reading list, okay? Now, I want to explain a book before I give its title, and I want you to choose carefully as to whether you want it or not. I don't want you later getting mad at me because I recommended it. It is not a Christian book. It is not a political book. It is an Illuminatus book. And it was written as a novel, supposedly, but it is a code book. And within the book is a step-by-step -step plan to take over the whole world by taking over the United States. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you the name of the book, and I just realized that. I started out, I'm getting ahead of myself. The book is called Atlas Shrugged. Oh, Atlas, you know, Atlas supposed to hold up the world? Shrugged, like you shrug your shoulders. Atlas Shrugged. The book was ordered, written, and produced by Philip Rothschild, the leader of the Illuminati in this day and age. It was ordered, written by a woman named Anne Rad, and she was at that time one of Philip Rothschild's mistresses. It was written some 12 years ago. And she wrote this book. It was supposed to be a novel. It's 1,100 pages, so if you don't like to read, don't buy it. She was already a well-known author, and her books sell nationwide. Mostly people who read them are communists. 